Okay, well, welcome to my podcast. I'm your host, Larry Liu, and uh, today I have two uh, guests that I al- already had previously on, so uh, Mike Bull and uh, Dennis Murphy. Uh, so, uh, Mike and Dennis, welcome uh, to the podcast. Welcome. Awesome. Thank you for having us. Yes. Uh, so, I, I, I think we'll just just continue the, the strain of thought that we had with, uh, with Mike and I discussed uh, which is uh, so, Mike. Your concern was about uh, the so the global South being neglected uh, in the discussions about uh, you know global in, in global discourse, right? Because we focus too much uh, on the global North. Yeah, that that was the major uh, thesis by Raywin Connell uh, in Southern Theory that uh, academia, as we know it. Uh, overwhelmingly is represented by the global north and the global north is creates theories to try to explain the phenomenon of what's happening in the global south and the argument is you know maybe we need to take global south uh how is it interpreted you know scholars from that part of the world you know um but but the argument is like i said is that much of what we think comes from the global north universities are mostly anchored in the global north, you know, big schools, uh, and we don't hear the voice from the scholars in the global south. So that's it's always been debated, you know, if that creates a problem, you know, how we analyze things in the world, glo- uh, poverty, uh, everything, you know. It's a, it's a thesis uh, uh, by Raywin Connell and her book uh, Southern Theory. I'm not sure if y'all are familiar with it, Southern Theory. The book. Uh, I, I, I've, I've, I haven't read her work, but I'm... Yeah. Uh, one it. example. Let me give you one example. In my pre-dissertation like research, I'm interested in, in the phenomenon of uh, urban squatting. And uh, there does exist squatting in, in, uh, in even in rich countries, you know, United States, Europe. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, sociologists that look at it through the lens of political squatting or alternative lifestyle, uh, alter- alternative lifestyle squatting, you know. So a lot of these theories come from the West. As soon as you use those same theories to try to, you know, uh, look at uh, a slum in Mumbai or a favela in uh, Brazil, you're confronted with a problem. You know, it's it's a different region of the world or different circumstances. Um, you know, it's different a scenario. So I don't know. So that creates problems if you're looking at it through a global uh, north lens, you know, because much of the theory yeah. develops in the global north. But problems exist globally south, too. So, yeah, that's a dilemma uh, uh, that's created. And I mean, so for me, the way how you put the global north and the global south together yeah. uh, is... Uh, is through, you know, the Communist Manifesto, you know, the main document by Karl Marx. Uh, and he basically pre- uh, argues that, you know, commodification is the way of the future. And so, of course, it started from uh, the British Industrial Revolution in the mid-18th century. Uh, and then it gradually seeps through uh, to, you know, North America, to Western Europe. Uh, then to Eastern Europe, uh, and um, you know, I think the only well, the, the, so there's two alternative paths to like classic capitalism, right? The one is the state socialism, which is the uh, um, you know like Soviet Union, Stalin, Lenin, etc., uh, communist Maoist China, um, and then the other is the yeah, what you described in like perhaps the uh, prevalent in the global south, right? Uh, which is uh, traditionalism, right? It's uh, and, it, and traditionalism takes two different forms. In in my conceptualization, uh, it can take the form of um, hunters and gatherer tribes, right? Like you know, foraging societies, uh, basically nomads. You know, people moving from one area to the next to fetch uh, food and resources they need. Uh, and then the other is like a feudal structure uh, or patrimonial structure, if you want to use the Weberian terminology, uh, mm. where basically uh, you have 
uh, a king, right, or lord, uh, and uh, you know he would be sort of the, the center of the political structure, and then the people below, you know, peasants, serfs, uh, they would produce the commodities, uh, you know, mostly food, uh, and then the surplus would be paid to the to the king to the center. Um, and what those traditional arrangements uh, have in common is that they don't have to be subject to the capital accumulation logic. Uh, now, the important prediction in the Communist Manifesto, however, is that commodification, you know, seeps into the, you could say, the non-commodified societies, which includes the hunter-gatherers as well as the uh, the patrimonial uh, feudal uh, structures. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's why my vantage point is, is you could <laughs> say, that I, I, I want to justify the bias in favor of the global north. Um, <laughs> because I think the global south's uh, future uh, is the present uh, of the global north. Um, mm. Do you want to dispute you, you that? Mean, that, you, mean that you mean that literally? literally? You think it will flip i'm trying to figure out how you're putting and let dennis come in too i'm trying to really understand you mean that the the, the problems of the global north that it will transform and become the global south is that what you what you mean or did i misinterpret you that it will, will be become the same dilemma that it will uh, yes yes so I, I think i think that's clearly the case so earlier we brought up the example of i think colin turnbull uh he was a anthropologist um and he did an uh, ethnographic study uh, of the, the Pygmies, uh, which is a hunting-gathering uh, tribe in, uh, I think, the east of Congo uh, in the 1950s. Uh, and, um, and even back then, there were some very interesting trends that were happening, right? So first of all, uh, some of the um, tribes members of the Pygmies uh, migrated to the Bantu villages, and so the Bantus are the, that's the mainstream Congolese population. Uh, they would be, you know, either farmers, right? They, they would be sedentary, uh, or they would work in a mine, uh, and then the mine would be, uh, you know, like taking out natural resources and then sell it to Western corporations, mm -hmm. uh, to the global economy. And uh, so that was already a transformation that was happening, even back then in the fifties. Um, the pygmies, they would then, you know, uh, th those who would work for the Bantu villages, uh, they would sort of, you know, come in and out to the home pygmy villages. Uh, but there would be some cultural transformation that would be happening. And the second thing that uh, Turnbull noted uh, was that uh, the mining companies uh, were basically encroaching on the land of the, of the pygmies. Uh, basically uh, taking away, seizing that land, uh, trying to pay them off, um, and and then the and then the tribes members who Turnbull interviewed would say, "Well, they're going to destroy my way of life <laughs> uh, mm. by by converting this piece of land into uh, into mining uh, territory." Because mining is very polluting to the environment, as you could imagine, uh, polluting to the groundwater, uh, but it also you know takes away that physical land, uh, and then what you have is 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 a process of proletarianization, right? Mm -hmm. It's like yeah. uh, you know the sort of society becomes uh, becomes commodified. Uh, and so I, I I don't know. There are still some cases of hunters and gatherers out there. I mean, um, but uh, they they are they are very rare. Uh, yeah. And I mean, patrimonial cap uh, version, patrimonial feudalism. I think that's also receding. Uh, the the area that seems to be expanding is patrimonial capitalism, right? Like. Mm -hmm. Uh, the, the you know maybe you could argue communist China might be in that camp. Uh, uh, I mean, or you know, if you look at the recent uh, events in Belarus, right, where 
Oh yeah, so, they yeah. had these uh, very contentious presidential elections, um, and, and and yesterday I was reading a bunch of speeches by Lukashenko. He's the he's the leader in Belarus, uh, and uh, basically in all of his statements, it's all in English, uh, so you can read mm-hmm. that. Um, is uh, it's, it's like a foreign agitator who's trying to <laughs> uh, from the Czech Republic and from Russia and from Poland, and they're all trying to get rid of him, of Lukashenko. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, yeah, but but that guy is is, is a patrimonial uh, ruler of the, of the worst kind, almost. Definitely, um, yeah, definitely, yeah, yeah. So but, working, but, go ahead. Yeah, working in the capitalist framework, though, right? So uh, yeah, and uh, I don't know where y'all want to go uh, with this uh, global events, news of events. Uh, Deconstructing uh, ideal types of uh, different kinds of systems that exist around the world, problem, political problems in the world, uh, global south, global north. It's up to y'all where you want to go with this. What I'm really uh, proposing uh, to uh, Larry is I, uh, I think the regime types that you created are fruitful mechan- methods that we can compare and contrast in the Vivarian sense. They're ideal types. And uh, you wrote that on your uh, blog. Um, but it doesn't quite capture uh, some of the problems that we're observing uh, globally. So here maybe I sound more like a postmodernist in the Ulrich Beck tradition. So I've been reading this book lately, and I'm trying to connect it to events, uh, World Risk Society. And it's it's difficult to capture current events, if you think about COVID-19, you know, uh, global warming, climate change, things like that, crisis in the, the global capitalist system. Uh, of course, those topics have always resonated uh, among sociologists. It's not it's not old stuff. But I wonder if we have to take it out of that old frame and put it into a new frame. And uh, I'm curious what y'all think of how you, you know, when you hear the word risk society, uh, have any of you ever heard of it? I'm curious uh, if that's too uh, pessimistic when you just listen to it. Uh, what? Well, let, let, let's bring yeah. Dennis in for now. Yeah, Dennis, Dennis has been talking. Comment on, uh, on anything <laughs> that we talked about the last couple of Yeah, Dennis, you, yeah <laughs> throw it at that. As, laugh, you're laughing. Go ahead. <laughs> well, ordinarily, I'm the one talking a little bit too much. Go, so go, I'm go, fine go. sitting back a little bit uh, to go. make a couple of comments just to show off that I've been paying attention. Uh, you were talking about a bias towards the global north when it comes towards the generation of scholarly research and understanding of global problems, particularly in the global south. I think that's I think that's necessary in within the confines of the current system because of how we do science. We generalize based off of available data and available research centers. And since they originated and typically dominate in the global north, there's less of it in the global south. You'll get a lot of people who go up north, get their degrees, come back south, but even when they do do that, there's not exactly the necessary embedded civil society or political structures that would support them to the same extent that you would say at Oxford or Leeds. So or- then they would. Uh, so then those Western trained uh, global South scholars they would go home, and then they would publish articles in Western journals citing English uh, language literature, which presumably <laughs> uh, would be the big theories of the of the West, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So Spanish, Spanish economic theory, uh, as far as I'm aware, is predominantly dominated by mostly classical or Marxist, uh, a Marxist orientation and to a substantially less degree, a Western liberal group. Um, when I'm thinking of prominent global southern Spanish-speaking economists, the only one that I'm really thinking of that would even be, that would really fit into a conservative model of pro-capitalism would probably be Hernando de Soto, the Peruvian economist. By the way, uh, he has quite a few interesting ideas about squatting, squatters' rights, the informal economy making into something rather amazing. I actually think I have his 
book somewhere. Well, it doesn't really matter. Oh, the point cool. is, uh, he has a very strong, uh, strong feelings about that because he tries to take Peru and says, well, what's happening, Peru? What's happening, Mumbai? None of that is unique. If you actually take a look at the founding of America and America's informal rights turning into formalized rights through squatting behaviors and movements, he's very pro that way. Otherwise, almost every economist that I've come across in the Spanish-speaking world, and uh, I, I must admit a pretty fatal handicap, I don't speak Spanish, so the English commentaries on the Spanish-speaking economic framework, uh, they typically run Marxist, and they typically run two to three decades almost behind what you would expect inside of a Western sense, uh, which is actually very curious, because that's the same thing that I came across when I was in China. So at Tsinghua University, their political science is uh, 30 years off of the political science that you'd find inside of the United States. A whole bunch of U.S.-educated uh, political scientists, PhDs, went over to Tsinghua University. And then when you go and engage with their international studies program, I'm a graduate of their international studies program, it's, <laughs> it's definitely a more realist, statist approach with a lot of lip service to liberalism and almost almost nothing for what would be considered more modern approaches to international relations over there. I would push back against the idea that the global south is the future of the global north because I don't actually see that. Uh, I, I see increasing formalization when I take a look at the global south. I see increasing rates of availability for adequate data. And I think that the more data we end up accumulating from the Global South will naturally result in a shift um, of emphasis and available research and data points to the Global South. When I take a look at that, I, I don't I don't see... Well, I, I will take a step back and I will say that I do think that we certainly see a degree of commodification and structural changes in the economy that makes the mounting inequality very reminiscent of the global south and i would say that there's increasing global inequality in the global south when i take a look at economic transformation i see a lot of movement in the direction away from the global south i see a lot of people trying to imitate the china model i'm taking a look at botswana rwanda um, for the most part i think that the global south's main major issues are legacy structural societal fissures, as well as fault lines of society that's causing them to break apart on the basis of instigating actions of global events that are either damaging the local ecology to the point where it's unsustainable, so the desertification of the Sahel region, um, mounting extremism, and quite a few other things along those natures. You still see a lot of stillborn or vague attempts to us instill a national identity that doesn't quite work. So you end up getting these nations that still have a lot of problems creating a strong cohesive framework and efforts to create a strong cohesive framework almost always will end up privileging the dominant subgroup within that society. So the pygmies in the Congo is actually a wonderful example of this. So the local Bantu population well, there are several um, major subdivisions, uh, like the Kinshasa region trying to... No, not Kinshasa, that's the capital. What's the... Um, there's an eastern region inside of the Congo that's been trying to get independent off and on ever since the Great African War. Mm. I, I'm, so there are subdivisions within that, but the Pygmies, small population, no real economic power, no real political power, no real martial power. They aren't they aren't considered part of the Congolese society with regards towards any attempt at national identity or subnational identity with breakaway states. Mm -hmm. So those are the main areas that I'm, I'm really uh -huh. worried about. I think you could probably try to resolve those and then you would end up finding a situation of very similar situations to say mounting and increasing economic sustainability such as inside of Southeast Asia, inside of some of their nascent projects inside of the Middle East. Really, COVID-19 murdered a lot of those projects. But if you take a look at what was going on in 2014, movements towards diversification of the economies, greater inclusivity in government, 
I, I need a squint at that one. I, I feel pain to say that because saying there's greater inclusivity is a bit like saying, well, the monarch isn't quite absolute. The dictator doesn't quite have as much freedom to kill you, but it's still not exactly what we would consider an inclusive pluralistic society by any means. But you can see a transition, a slight move. For instance, Qatar was patting itself on the back for increasing its local representation of local government. And I'm like, you're still an absolute monarchy. <laughs> but um, Well, so in inclusivity, just the context here, you were referring to the Asimolu and Robinson uh, theorem that uh, you can have uh, inclusive institutions uh, where you invest in you know, human capital and social infrastructure and uh, education infrastructure, etc., uh, versus right. the sort of extractive uh, institutions okay. where it's all about basically exactly that, that's the one you're putting, basically putting more money into the pockets of the of the corrupt oligarchs uh, and uh, you know, not developing the, the broader society. Uh, yeah, that's the vicious cycle. So the iron law of oligarchy gets uh, quite a few mentions. Which is, there's structural pressures to continue to become corrupt no matter what type of society that you're engaging in. Whereas creating a virtuous cycle it is more difficult, but it's still possible. And one of the ways to make it possible is to increase locuses of power. So it's interesting that you brought up the patriarchal feudalistic society because the patriarchal feudal society faced its major downfall due to the increasing prominence of local shareholders and local capitalists. And then those local capitalists were broadly displaced by substantially larger capitalists alongside various local arrangements and intermarriages with local nobilities, unless you go off and run to the new world and create a republic in the United States, in which case new logics take over to create a new upper class. So yeah. So, so uh, Dennis, I'm sorry, I'm thinking more sociologically, I guess your tradition comes from political science, right? You said political international, and international relations. Yeah. Are you familiar with the work of uh, Ronald Engelhardt, that cultural yeah, like modernization, and he tries to map out this idea, I think he does it empirically too, I don't know how well, but that uh, in the global south there is this survival values fixation and some some regions of the world fit into different kind of values per se and the western is more like individualized more materialistic and you know more individualistic things like that and some countries don't quite fit into certain areas maybe they're intermediary but usually a lot of the poor countries they're interpreted as being traditional like larry said uh and uh survival value oriented which explains sometimes uh the phenomenon of squatting, you know, uh, in a big form, just survivalists, you know, they're, they're looking to survive. And in, in the West, for me, it's interesting because when, when we look at squatting, we look at it more legally, you know, like it's a legal issue, it's private property, um, there's a lot of political things attached to squatting. But if you look at it through a, a global South, uh, you know, dimension, it is about survival. You know, some people are just trying to survive in Mumbai or um, in Brazil, right? I don't know, if you heard of Ronald Engelhardt's Engelhard, work, what's your thoughts are, and y'all, do y'all know what I'm talking about, Ronald Engelhardt's work? I definitely, it's a kind of, yeah. I definitely know the argument, yeah. and I've definitely heard the name. It's a cultural, like, modernization thesis. It's like, it's a secularization goes one direction, and traditionalism is a barrier sometimes for economic growth. It's very similar to Rosto, Walter Rosto's. Mm -hmm. You know, okay. the state five stages of growth um, theory. I, I would definitely yeah. buy that to some extent, if only because we're in a much more mature economy. The very way in which we define poverty in the United States is fundamentally different. Our poorest citizens are highly in debt, but starvation isn't normally a concern unless you're excluded from the overall economic structures. So an undocumented migrant where no one really knows about them. That's where you're going to find the greatest areas of starvation risk. What instead you'll find is a lot of people who are food insecure or who are malnutrition. But their idea of malnutrition is higher rates of obesity, too much access to fatty foods. This is a very different type of environment. And squatting is typically seen as opposing large corporations and large lands or political deals. At least as far as my understanding of it is, you're nodding. So I guess I'm 
I, I'm, oh, I'm remembering a few things correctly. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. But with regards well, towards Mumbai, yeah. it's I don't have a house anymore. The traditional means of capital are no longer around, and I need to get a job somewhere. So let's go to a place where there are a lot of people. There's a way to engage in an informal economy or a yeah. black market economy that you're able to get to. Very and able. while you're there, maybe something interesting can happen because no one, after a certain critical mass is reached, people don't go in and actually remove slums. Doing that results in riots it results in a collapse of local political control so for the most part it's authorities are keeping them at arm's length they're aware of everything that's informal and potentially chaotic and they're trying to manage chaos the best they can in the noble sense and in the very ignoble sense they engage in a lot of corruption to extract whatever they can in order to ensure that the people well maybe they'll die maybe they'll die a lot younger maybe they won't have a lot of resources but we're going to essentially try to create a subsistence level classical Marxian approach to maintaining a population and taking what you can. Um, so th there are two sides of that coin. You'll find both sides in this one. Um, usually angels don't do well in power, though. That's the iron law of oligarchy. So um, you'll find a lot of people trying to do the best they can. And then that typically doesn't end well, even if they get in power for any number of years. So yeah, I, I definitely understand the two very different modes of squatting. And since we're trying to generalize from available data points inside of the global north, if we're going to try to approach squatting from the sense of here we have squatters in the U.S., we can use it to make predictive models. It seems to work in Canada, Australia, the U.K. It also seems to do well in Europe. I guess we can then just make this global model of squatting and then you're and scratching your head saying hey wait it doesn't actually it doesn't actually really work here does it so that's regional dynamic regional dynamic and you're right uh the relative autonomy of the state you know what role does the state play in all this and i, I want to say thank you for bringing up squatting i don't want y'all to make that your major topic uh there's one thing i wanted to defend larry i wanted to defend larry the original thesis was that the global north is starting to become more like the global south well, there's a reversal of no, uh, the something like that. Is that what you're saying again? Well, the global I... south is going to become more like global north. I mean, I but it Rever vice versa. Yeah, because so it, it could also be that you know, like I, I guess you're familiar with like Branko Milanovic. I mean, the, uh, the World Bank economist that I cited uh, in, in my blog, uh, where you know he talks about sort of like this famous elephant curve, right? Uh, which right. I think is a I think it's it's the best way to, or I mean, the best available data, to my knowledge, at least, uh, to describe, you know, the, the the global income distribution, how that is gradually changing, mm -hmm. where essentially, you know, the losers of globalization are the ones that are between, I think, 80th to 95th percentile or something. Uh, and uh, that includes the middle classes uh, that we have here uh, in the developed uh, West. Uh, and so, so when Mike says that you know, well, global North future uh, could be uh, a, a, a Southification, which basically means mm. Brazilianization. Uh, yeah, Brazilianization like, of the West. That's what they yeah, say. Right. So it's like a growth of the informal economy. Uh, the collapse of uh, labor unions, uh, the sort of like uh, in, in, yeah, in, in informality of the of the of the economy, uh, the insecurity of your of our economic uh, futures, the fact that you know even if we do get a PhD and all of us are involved in these programs now, that uh, we're not actually guaranteed that we get the middle class job. I mean, all these things. Uh, it, that that to me is. Uh, yeah, it's a southification of the global north. That's definitely or the Brazilianization. Uh, I, I, I'm quite worried about that as well. But um, uh, but then, but I guess the main point I was making earlier was was the opposite, where the 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 the, 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 the global south. I mean, that's just my extrapolation from the Communist Manifesto. And I mean, obviously, you don't have to like if if if, if you don't uh, like that. Uh, 
Oh, kind of way way of thinking, then maybe it doesn't make much sense. But to oh, me, but but to me, this is like this forward march of commodification of uh, of, of capitalism, and we all become capitalists. Uh, I, I I think that's a very powerful idea, and I you know uh, I would say that Francis Fukuyama's uh, thesis end of history, that, uh, yeah, end of history. Um, so. It was it was only wrong to suggest that liberal democracy is the way of the future, right? So the future of the world, um, uh, because you know we we do have a movement to its uh, ethnic nationalism, which is also reflected in uh, Fukuyama's latest uh, work. I think twenty eighteen. I forgot the title. Identity. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, the national identity is important and stuff. Um, but uh, but. But then sort of this uh, Marxian Hegelian dialectics in which Fukuyama drew upon, um, which is, mm. yeah, exactly that book. The, 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 Give me my books too. Yeah, the, 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 the Marx... I have a bookshelf right next to me, sorry. It's just well, too easy. Have, uh, yeah. You guys are in the position. <laughs> that is okay. um, yeah. yeah, so, but in any case, the, uh, the, um, the, the idea of commodification spreading out all over the world I, th I i i think that thesis can be defended and i will yeah. defend it anytime yeah <laughs> okay. I, I, so I'll, uh, I'll agree with that one a whole lot more um, yeah, go for it. so i guess i was just responding to the words and not the substantive argument underneath the words so yeah i i, I definitely um i definitely agree to that as in i don't well i agree with it enough to retract uh, some of my perhaps more surface level concerns earlier. Yeah. What were you going to say, Mike? I was going to add something. I I agree with uh, Larry, and obviously, Dennis, I agree with you, too. Uh, you know, maybe uh, we can't make it that simple. Uh, we're looking back at just the Communist Manifesto. I'm more in the direction of George Ritzer, uh, the McDonaldization idea. <laughs> that this, uh, it is... You know, it's because when you look at the Communist Manifesto, it's 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 legacy of the old left. It is a different century, different time frame, right? And we got to think more modern. I think there's an ideological kind of colonization. There's corporations and logos. There's symbols. There's signs. Um, there's new kinds of companies, right? But I like the George Ritzer model, uh, the, or the idea of this McDonaldization effect. And I could see, we can see that happening clearly. So could you define it for our listeners? Uh... Um, well, the idea of the McDonaldization thesis was that uh, the fast food sector starts to influence other sectors, and this grows and beyond. So not just a form of rationalization, but how you organize the company. You know, it's, it's in the image of McDonald's, and then McDonald's externalizes. So it's, whole, it's whole about world. the franchise model. It's about uh, the yeah, it's yeah, it's a general <laughs> change in rationalization. So it's not just political, but also it uh, infects. You could say it infects other uh, in sectors of our economy. It in, it infects institutions like the state, the uh, higher education, the healthcare. The McDonaldization idea, you know, that it it's it's the logic of it, right? So that's why I think the the manifesto is great in its time when it was written. It's an old left piece, but it lacks that making that connection, right? Making that connection in a modern society that we live in, in a post-industrial, uh, right, kind of society, network-based society, if you want, to, you want to use Castell's theory, right? Mm -hmm. So we're also shifting our economies, technologically we're shifting, right? Uh, so I think McDonaldization thesis, that's a better kind of, for me, what? it's a, so. It's a, so yeah. one part of the thesis that I like about Ritzer was uh, the yeah. blurring of the boundary okay. between the consumers and the workers, right? Yeah. So, so because so, so if you go back to the mid nineteenth century and the Manchester capitalism, right, that that Marx used to describe, uh, you've got this strong men, mostly. I mean, it's very masculine, I guess. Indus the industrial worker. Well, I guess there are female workers in the textile production, but uh, but in any case, so mm -hmm. so a lot of physical labor, uh, a lot of manufacturing labor, industrial production, right? So that was the center of the labor theory of value. Yeah, and, uh, and then it seems to be that 
the shift that we've been experiencing over the course of especially the 20th century um, is that, uh, yeah, th that, as you say, McDonaldization. So the fact that I mean, maybe more people are working for McDonald's or for a similar industry like Starbucks, yeah. whatever, yeah. The precarious workforce. Uh, who, who's the guy who writes a guy standing, right? Guy standing. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. So, they, so we are sort of moving in a world where more and more people are in the yeah. precarious workforce. That's a, that's the labor side. Uh, and then on the consumer side, um, the, the the consumer performs the labor, right? So if I if I go yeah. to McDonald's and I'm supposed to carry the tray <laughs> to to my table and I'm supposed to put the tray back and then uh, d dump the plastic in the uh, the garbage and whatever. Uh, self checkouts I, at Walmart. Right? Self checkouts at Walmart, exactly. So yeah. it's yeah. about. The, the, the prosumer, I think, was was the terminology. I don't, I don't know who used that. But it's like, yeah, you blur yeah. the boundaries. Yeah, I want to let Dennis come in, too, if you like, if you have any comments. Uh, just one more thing I wanted to take from the manifesto, which a lot of people skip. It's not to say that Marx didn't philosophically think of the idea. There's a famous quote in the manifesto. You know, All of you, I'm sure, heard of it. He says, all that is solid melts into thin air. Right. That drives the postmodernists. That's their that's their, you know, old quote. In a way, uh, if you think of it, you, you could deconstruct the new economy that we're in. It does start to liquefy. You know, everything uh, is no so longer as it was. Everything is breaking world. apart. We have a kind of disorganized capitalism, which is very globalized. It's uh, outsourced as far as we know. You know, I mean, it's digital now. It's. There's a. It's very unclear who's an employee, who's the employer. Uh, you know, uh, what was his name? Eric Olin White. Uh, now he was he was more Marxist, but he called it a contradictory class location problem. People don't even know where they're located. You know, because they're in between positions. Just think of in academia. It's you know adjuncts and you know what what are their present you know positions right. It's it's a very uh, liquid kind of world. It's a very uh, unpredictable un unpredictable world. It moves very fast, you know, very fast. So that's a lot of philo philo philosophical uh, analysis mixed together with it is changing. I mean, the world that we live in is changing rapidly, and who's responsible for the change? How are the political institutions uh, adjusting or responding? And that's where I think this whole risk society. Uh, idea is what we really think. We're maybe in a risk economy. I don't know. Uh, I think I think we're in something else. I don't think we're in a traditional boxed, you know, economy where everything is predictable. And it's 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 very uncertain, you know. Uh, right? I don't know. You can, may disagree. Uh, it's not as stable as it was like during World War Two. No, definitely not. And it's it has ups and downs. You know, it's. It's very fluid. Like. What what true to me is an example of instability. I mean, like that those few years of war. I think that's uh, <laughs> that's uh, even less certainty than what we have today. But uh, yeah, but that, but the post war post World War Two period that was uh, yeah home ownership in the United States. You know, and it was a great time to live in that time period. But if you think nineteen eighties, nineteen nineties, you already see it happening. Right? Shift There's in your liberalism. Yeah. yeah, it's a really disorganized risk kind of environment and it's yeah. uh and it uh did you see a lot of uh, major events not just you know political ecological events like chernobyl uh right fukushima uh so they, these move beyond i think uh boundaries national boundaries they probably are always have but they are becoming more visible to us now so i don't know y'all can tell i like this book i'm trying to like well so so in just about labor <laughs> relations i mean uh, because in yeah. Arnie Kalleberg's book on good jobs, bad jobs, like he, yeah. he has like this uh, the pendulum swing uh, metaphor of labor relations. Um, I think that's following on the heels of Karl Polanyi, like his thesis about commodification versus decommodification. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and then basically he argues that you know the pendulum swings uh, in either extreme, and uh, and then sort of like well, and. So, I, I I do have a little bit of an issue, obviously, with that simplification because 
purple army? Yeah, yeah, because so you have the we we know we have the swing to its neoliberalism, right? As about nineteen eighties, as Mike mentioned. But it's like, where do we have the guarantee that it's going to swing back to uh, more economic security? Um, I don't necessarily, you know, I, I mean, so it, it could happen, right? I mean, the, you know, like I'm not saying it will never happen, but, uh, uh, but it, it's, it's like we, we definitely don't see that swing in that direction. I mean, in my essay of nationalist capitalism, uh, I, I essentially argue that you know capital accumulation and a nationalist capitalism will not be restored, um, which is you know an important part of creating confidence in the capitalist economy, right? Just to restore economic growth uh, for all sorts of reasons, you know, aging of population, you know, the demographic aging. Uh, it's about uh, the limits that climate change imposes on us naturally, right? That we uh, cannot freely burn fossil fuels in the old ways, um, and uh, yeah, and also you know the the fact that you know we have too much inequality now, so we can't you know we 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 can't really push more people into increased consumption. Uh, so I'm not necessarily seeing logically the the step back to its the pendulum swing to its decommodification and uh, greater economic security for the masses. Um, yeah, it, it's a pessimistic analysis, but maybe, you know, uh, maybe something better will come along. Uh, so I'd push back against that, actually. Okay, please. Because in the modern Democratic Party, there's a very strong desire to increase security. And even in the lip service of the modern Conservative Party, there is a desire to instill economic security. We can make the argument that the policies are not in place to actually guarantee that, but there is a certain upswell of people putting that forward. For instance, I know quite a few conservative people who are wholly on board now with basic ideas of health care services. Uh, many people are starting to put this idea of a nationalist-based economy such that it serves the needs of its citizens first. That's the rhetorical justification for it. Whether or not that rhetorical justification is matched by reality is easily debatable, and we could probably say that it definitely doesn't do that on a factual basis, but the underlying philosophical grounding behind it, when you hear people go to various rallies supporting it, the underlying premise is that you're going to try to bring back jobs, that you're going to try to revive dead sectors of the economy, and you're trying to make it so that people can work. Now, the fundamental tension that I see there is that these people are trying to capture a sun that's already set. It's a very nostalgic, past-orientated growth framework without any recognition that the underlying logic of economic growth killed those off as viable opportunities. The structural nature of the economy is now that we're moving away from those jobs. Whether or not they're as mushy and uncertain or based on risk is certainly something to discuss, but we are in a cognitive labor force. We are in something specialized, not so much in what we create, but what we think and how we move and maneuver in a space that's inherently based on language. So, so we are, we are enriching uh, Facebook and Google through, you know, you know, the data that we feed into the algorithm. But yeah, Google search, this podcast is going to join that. <laughs> yeah, it's just, uh, you know, it's going to be automatically transcribed and then Mark Zuckerberg is going to listen to the, the crap that we talk Until about. Until the end of time, right? Until the very end, we'll, yeah. we'll circulate through cyberspace. Right? Yeah. Uh, uh, Dennis, I wanted to make a comment. I, I agree with your analysis. Uh, um, you said the... Ideas and language increasingly will play a role. Did I understand you correctly? Mm -hmm. Ideas and language and how conceptions of how people conceive of counter, counter contradicting what really is happening objectively. Is that is that where you're getting at? So, yeah, it's, so it's one thing that politicians say and make promises, but the material objective economy is in a, on a totally different direction. Oh is yeah, what, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the. Um, the language and the rhetoric of it is very much in the idea of a self-care framework. So the left is traditionally class-based or now 
ethnic minority based or sexual minority based, um, disenfranchised based. Let's go with yep. disenfranchised based, while the right is more on a nationally based. Uh, there's also a fundamental tension in that the right wants to get people to go back to work. It's not meant, it's often understood, at least in our end of the spectrum, as that's meant to be a callous statement. But a lot of people derive meaning in life through what they do. So the idea of having people go back to work and be able to establish ownership and control over their lives by having a stable job, it's one of the most seductive things in the world. Whereas on the left, it's more like, okay, we aren't really sure that that's possible anymore. So instead, we're just going to try to make it so that you have what you need to get by. And what is defined as need and what is defined as get by is gradually increasing. Um, you certainly see a massive move towards UBI that wasn't there before coronavirus. And I'm so, guilty too. I'm guilty too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're, you're seeing a lot of things about um, controls over rents. A lot of people are opposing legal evictions now. Even Republicans are saying no, landowners can't kick out people because they haven't been to work. It's all, it's a fundamental groundbreaking change in the rhetoric of how we approach the economy. Now, whether or not that's actually reflected anywhere, who knows? As in, yeah. right I mean, now... So it's, it's, it's a reflected in the emergency of the pandemic, but I guess would your argument be that you know, let's say we find a vaccine, let's say next spring, right? Uh, everybody gets vaccinated. Mm -hmm. uh, we go back to quote unquote normal. I mean, w w what's your anticipation of the There's no such economy? thing as normal. Normal's dead. We already know how growth returns to an economy. Um, so right now, it's almost a practical guarantee that even if you were able to reset everything, a lot of jobs will simply never come back. And where they're never coming back are in the suburbs, they're in rural lands. They are not in major cities. You're going to see massive growth in opportunity of employment in the few areas of the economy that are doing well. Information economy is definitely one of them. You're going to see a lot of jobs returning to the major cities that have heavy set, um, I don't want to say silicon based economies, but information based economies, telecommunication based economies. But you're not going to see that at all in a lot of the countryside. Now, granted, due to the online nature of some work, sure, you're going to have a lot of people who are able to do high-paying jobs in the middle of nowhere if they have a reliable internet connection, but that's not going to be everyone. Mm -hmm. The economy is not coming back. The economy didn't really come back after 2008. It got moved around, and people needed to follow or they suffered. And I think that what's going on right now is a massive ground shift in the underlying economic structure of productivity. Now, there is a... Um, underlying sustainability to capitalism in large part because of the blurring between the producer and the consumer. You want people to consume, therefore you must give them the ability to produce enough to consume. Whereas before it was just to extract until they die, now people definitely do still need to be around and buying in order for the economy to work around. So you certainly see it, it will be a slow death, but it will be around. But yeah, I don't find it feasible to imagine a society whereby politicians who have most of their constituents out of work or underemployed will then say, okay, rent controls, wage controls, welfare benefits are all going to be cut. That Maybe they'll be cut, but they won't be erased. The pandemic economy's legacy will be embedded within the rhetoric and the policies of the political institutions moving forward. I. Mm. I guess I can imagine a society, so I'll take it back, I can imagine a society that would do that, but I could only imagine it if they're suicidal. And I don't think we are in that situation. Yeah. Do you, uh, can I ask, Dennis, do you think possibly with a Biden presidency that uh, we're going to shift definitely more in a Keynesian direction, a Keynesian economic direction, um, that uh, that may be another way that the state becomes an actor in the economy, a more uh, fruitful actor, or, or say, using its power, you know, uh, something like the New Deal, you know, uh, or perhaps a pilot basic income program. I don't know. Um, but I'm curious if we're going to shift in that direction uh, with a, assuming Biden wins, I don't know, with the post offices and all that happening. Give them two thirds. <laughs> yeah, like, do you think, uh, well, we'll, we'll a Keynesianism is going to make a comeback, I, I assume. 
uh, to some extent, you can say that the right has also kind of experimented with military Keynesianism, right? Uh, in the past, I'm mm -hmm. curious, uh, in what ways the old man, John Maynard Keynes, maybe had it right, you know, I don't know. Uh, to what extent the state will, you know, counter-react counter if it will uh, make more institutions free, like schools, if it will... Uh, What's it with the loans? Forgive the loans or something? The college debt loans? If it will do that? If it will revitalize mm -hmm. certain sectors like with public transit? I don't know. I'm curious what's going to happen. What are what are y'all y'all's prognosis with a, a potential Biden presidency? I guess is it going to be a Keynesian turn? It's you definitely going to be a Keynesian turn. Although, um, funny thing about modern economics: the difference between neo Keynesians and the new um, monetarists is almost nothing. A lot of them buy into a lot of the same fundamental precepts. It's just a matter of whether or not there are, there are two key distinctions between the two, and they're actually kind of small now. I, I just put this book, you know, The Entrepreneurial State. That's what uh, Larry's got me reading right now. <laughs> <laughs> is there a book club that I'm not invited? No, to? you need to start reading. Uh, just listen to all this podcast. You can get all these books. Oh. Um, all right. No, I, I think maybe the state can uh, promote innovation. It could obviously cur has the power of money. I mean, well, it has to go through Congress, right? But oh, the yeah. state is often seen as something uh, irrelevant. But if even if we look at even nowadays with SpaceX. I mean, the seed money has to come from the state. I mean, the, the big major influencing institution, the state usually finances. I'm not saying that private capital is not relevant, but often the public funds are used and can be used, you know, particularly in infrastructure. So I'm wondering how that's going to play out. I know there's going to be a kind of partisanship between Democrats and Republicans on this, but I'm curious, even now with um, high speed the Internet, I don't know how that's going to go. Uh, that's a great job. Whoa, 5G, 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 yeah, 5G telecommunication frameworks. Yeah, those are fun. Or free high speed internet for all, you know, that could be a good utopian project. You know? I mean, yeah, and as far as utopian projects are concerned, <laughs> that might actually happen because Google and Facebook are trying desperately to ensure that people have free access to the internet so that they can keep using it. Keep flying, yeah. So, yeah. um, in certain yeah. countries, Facebook is the internet. <laughs> Because Facebook um, provides it and it automatically redirects to them and then you need to leave Facebook. So Facebook is the first thing that you see. So that's, I, I wouldn't be surprised if um, internet becomes free or at the very least very cheap in the future. In our uh, lifetime, right? Probably. Yeah, probably in our lifetime, probably in 20 years. I know that there's already movements in um, certain parts of Europe. I forget the exact parts of Europe where it's becoming a human right um, well, by, by the way, the, the, the technically correct term would be free at the point of service, right? Ah. Uh, because, uh, of course, you do pay for it because we, with your data, right? So, because, because yeah. you know, uh, you know, Mark and, uh, and those and those people, uh, Larry Page, Sergey Brin, uh, they need to make money too, right? So, they, yeah. well, everyone needs to make money, apparently. Yeah. Well, that is the underlying thing of being in a capitalist economy. <laughs> well, but then you know, we have to quote uh, 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 Orwell, George Orwell, right? Yeah. Uh, was, you know, some animals are more equal than others. And ah, okay. Some, some, some money makers are also more equal than others. I mean, I guess like if, if the three of us, you know, uh, get our, you know, small university stipend, I don't think that uh, there'll be too much objection to it from a social inequality perspective, um, but uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, if you are, if you're Jeff Bezos, you know, you're having 182 billion dollars uh, net worth. Uh, some of that. Yeah, yeah, that would be that would be that would be quite nice. You know, if, if Jeff is is listening to this podcast, maybe we can sort of uh, <laughs> donate something. Uh, but um, yeah, uh, definitely. Uh, yeah. So, so, yeah, so, uh, yeah. So, I think the the big trend that we have to worry about is is inequality. And 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 to to Mark's question about whether Biden is going to put us assuming in, assuming he I don't know I don't know what will happen. Yeah, uh, is really he going to put us into a Keynesian trajectory? And I uh, so uh, so I, I think the benchmark comparisons are very important. If you say compared 
to Clinton and Obama, I would say the answer is yes. I think it will be definitely be much more uh, interventionist. Uh, there'll be more government spending, as you mentioned, uh, student debt forgiveness. Uh, it would be like a big cut to the uh, federal government revenues, um, you know, the interest that they collect in student debt and stuff. I mean, uh, but there's a lot of other issues. Um, like the $2 trillion investment plan on the green energy, you know, which is a, a nod to the Green New Deal, right? Uh, renewable energy. Um, and uh, uh, adding a public option to Medicaid, a, a Medicare, that would be a big thing because, because if, we, if, if we design it in the, in the socially optimal way, which is meaning you give robust coverage, uh, you, den you, don't, you don't deny people for pre-existing conditions, uh, it should actually uh, drive out the private uh, insurance uh, out of business. Um, that would be a social you know, benefit, right? Um, so if, if all of these things do get realized, um, I think we are moving in a better direction. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, in, in my essay, I mean, I was very pessimistic about social democratic capitalism uh, because I believe that um, you, know, you would have to go back to the same... How should I say, uh, nature extracting, resource exploiting, political economy, you know, maximize economic growth because you have to share the gains between organized labor and uh, mm -hmm. business community. Uh, mm -hmm. And of course, the state, because the state has to raise more taxes to fund the welfare state. Um, so uh, that, that's the cushy social democratic structure. Uh, I, th I think is not ecologically desirable uh, and, uh, and not sustainable at all. Uh, mm -hmm. So, uh, I mean, we, we always see issues like, so my big prediction mm -hmm. about the 21st century is, uh, mm -hmm. is mass migration, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so, what we, I mean, we already see indications of that, the 2015 refugee wave in, in Western Europe um, but we're going to see much more of that. I mean, like the the dry periods in uh, in the Horn of East Africa. Uh, you know, you had also a locust plague happening there. Uh, you have uh, big floods in like Bangladesh and South Asia. Um, I, I don't I don't know. I, I you know huge population densities. So you know like. The, the, the water goes down, right? The water table, so people are having to probably move from where they live. Uh, so, you know, and, and then, of course, I mean, I grew up in Austria, so I know that there's xenophobic sentiments uh, all over the West rising up. Uh, I think that's definitely going to get worse. And having to deal with this kind of uh, mass migration as climate change advances. I think that will be the biggest challenge to, uh, to you know, how we can maintain stable societies. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, maybe I can make a comment, uh, Larry, and ask a question to Dennis. Uh, maybe the new conflict uh, will not be between nation states per se. You know, the old fashioned conflict, big powers versus medium sized powers or whoever, the, whatever the new warfare will be. But I'm thinking more regional, you know, regional, global south, global north, more and more antagonism, scarcity of resources, uh, ecological crisis, and this creates a vacuum for conflict and war. I could see water wars, like you said, water wars, I could see that really happening. I think that's already happening. Uh, you know that's happening, uh, suicide trends in rural areas of India, and uh, ecological destruction, you know, Brazilian forest, right? Uh, so, yeah. yeah, yeah, we're seeing that already happening. But I'm curious if that's going to play out regionally as, you know, a kind of conflict that between globalized north and the global south. Uh, one example I want to give is North Africa, the wall that was built between one of the Spanish uh, and, yeah, and the image of North Africans trying to overcome the wall and this, this divide between the global south and the global north. I, I think that's more observable. 
that will be that that will be the conflict of the new century, you know, the new fifty years. I, I think it's not between countries themselves, maybe minor conflict, you know, some little scrubbles here and there, but regional imbalances of global power is very unequal and um and then maybe uh, like you said migration uh of course for many europeans i mean it, how how far back does that go i mean since the beginning of time but but the last 10 15 years the migration has kind of increased you know especially for particular vul vulnerable areas uh right yeah. global hot spots if you like so I guess we're also in the business of trying to predict the hot spots of the future. And my, my, my idea is, is it's going to be areas, you know, where there's ecological uh, problems, food crops, failures, regi weak regimes, anarchy, you know, uh, governments that fall apart, right? Yeah. So maybe political science can help us there, too. I, I think uh, we always take uh, investment in the state. Well, what happens if a state fails, you know? And it seems to be uh, happening more and more, uh, not just in the global north. I mean, there's legitimacy crisis, but also in the global south. The state sort of fails to bind society together and corruption and everything else, right? Right, despot, right? Right. Yeah. So, um, yeah. I don't know uh, I think. This is this is where wearing multiple hats are, I guess, <laughs> literally. So I guess I'll just do this right now. Oh, well, 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 well. So... I okay. actually have um, three areas of concentration. The first is economics, the second is political science, and the third is war. Oh, wow. Quite literally war. Uh, it's actually strategic studies, which is the politics of the use of force. It is traditionally known as war. It's applied military history. Um, is so, it yeah. called war? Uh, uh, Dennis, is it war or is it called peace and conflict studies <laughs> yeah, are you emphasizing the war part or are you starting a so, conflict so resolution when i was at american university it was yeah. called peace global security and conflict resolution very okay. passive and nice when i applied to graduate school um i applied to a couple of programs that were war studies programs a couple oh, wow. of programs that was like now military college like a military college very similar yeah uh, so okay. science so i go to john I recently graduated from Johns Hopkins SICE. Johns Hopkins SICE is a wow. is a school that's about a third population military, or at the very least, my program is about a third population military. Uh, so I have lieutenant colonels inside of my classes. I've studied under generals. I that is my world. So if if <laughs> I, I think that one might be a little bit better than uh, political science for understanding. Um, the conflicts of the future. So a few things that you're spot on about. Um, the classical conception of a Westphalian approach towards war and state competition is dying, and it's dying fast. It was already dying earlier, quite purposefully, through Wilsonian democracy, a uh, reimagining of Kant, the, the basic idea of economic interdependence, the burgeoning of the utopians and the international liberal order. That was definitely undermining a lot of what is considered the autarkic approach to statecraft and state warfare, if it was ever true, which it never really was entirely true. But Westphalia is something that you'll hear by everyone and their grandmother when it comes to understanding the state system. Mm -hmm. That has been dying, and it's been dying rapidly. And one of the ways that it has been almost effectively killed off has to do with the information revolution. So this is things like the internet. Um, it, because in large part, earlier... When this is all fair for the non-political scientists. So Westphalian Treaty 1648. So the assumption mm -hmm. is that the nation states would uh, respect each other's uh, boundaries and yeah. wouldn't interfere in the internal affairs of the other country, right? It, is, it established the head of state or the head of government as the highest unity, highest political authority of a governing polity. So the Catholic Church wasn't able to mess with other countries anymore. It tried. It, it, the history of Europe... Well, you can't do it officially, right? You would have yeah, to yeah, yeah. Like, From yeah. the 1600s down to even now is just a history of the Catholic Church's relevance going this way. And I say that as a legacy Catholic, so... Uh, just well, secularization, too, you know? True, part true, true. Yeah. But secularization is in large part partially because 
of the Westphalian system, the idea that the state is something that is paramount. And if you have a bunch of competing religious groups within the state, then you can't privilege one over another. Therefore, you need a secular society. And if you have different groups with similar religions competing with each other, well, then that means the religion, the religious bond between nations ends up acting as a constraint. And then that also needs to be de-emphasized. So you, it started happening fairly early on, like Cardinal Richelieu, he, he um, him and uh, Louis the Sun King, they had their own little nice little way to make France far more secular in orientation. And it was a cardinal doing this, I might add, just to the point where he was making a relationship, a uh, informal relationship with the Ottoman Empire to try to go against it, it. Let's just say that it becomes a little bit of a mess. But yeah, Westphalia is a system that it's not entirely dead, but it's in a position of transition. It's changing. And the world that we're entering into, it maintains a lot of the trappings of Westphalia, but it's not really Westphalian anymore. So it's not going to be state to state. Instead, what you'll see is loose organization of states. Because one of the big things that a lot of states are realizing is that when everyone was under the protection of a global hegemon, uh, your borders were secure from everyone except the hegemon. When the hegemon ends the hegemony ends and you start entering into a rivalrous period with multiple great powers then small nations are deeply insecure and this insecurity drives them to do one of three things uh, this is more classical statism but one of the big things that they'll do is that they'll try to group up because if you have a collection of states putting things together for their own collective security then that's a very big plus in establishing your security. So that's something that you see instead of Europe right now. Eastern Europe is one of the strongest proponents of a strong national defense inside of the entirety of the European Union. They're far more militaristic in large part because they have very insecure borders with Russia. Um, another example of what they'll try to do is um, it's called bandwagoning, where they'll find a larger power and they'll be like, please be our friends. Uh, this is something that you'll also find in Eastern Europe. It's why they want to have more American soldiers on the ground. Basically, they want to make sure that I don't care if you put five boots on our border. If the Russians shoot, they'll be shooting at them, which means they're shooting at America, which means they're more likely to support us. And then there's another approach, which is you just build a nuke. And then you say, if you mess with us, you die. But the funny thing is that wars right now are very costly. So traditional conquest or traditional warfare doesn't happen anymore. We haven't actually had a traditional war in a very long time. The idea of Vietnam, Afghanistan, and Iraq, those weren't traditional wars. Neither was the Gulf War. Uh, the last traditional war was actually... It's asymmetric yeah. warfare, it seems mm -hmm. to be, right? To uh, fight it's, against guerrilla forces. Yeah, it, it's not against another state. It's against either an idea, a sub-state actor, or a revolutionary group pretending to be a state. Uh, so the Taliban is a, it's a nice little Maoist jihadist group that's trying to take over the country, um, pretending it's a rival government. So we're supporting usurpers and infidels while they're the true representation of what is Afghanistan. It's essentially a way of saying that all wars now are civil wars. And all civil wars are not domestic concerns anymore. They are externalized. So the Russians, the Chinese, every major power with the capability of influencing civil wars do so. And you're yeah, seeing I, I, this. I recently read this article about uh, the Wagner Group, uh, which is... Uh, Libya. I was like just a, running right into that. Foreign uh, mercenary group. Uh, and, and it's private, like by private a, company or something? Or private, yeah. Like Blackwater so, USA or something? Yeah, something like, like that. Yeah, private yeah. militias or... Yeah. I would really recommend looking up a book called Corporate Warriors by P.W. Singer. Okay. That is a book that I'm going to consider mandatory reading for anyone interested in privatized warfare because it's not actually, a lot of it isn't actually really private. It's just a way to create plausible deniability to have a buffer between the state and the actual group. But it's also, it's also they have a whole lot more freedom to act in ways that are very... Um, contrary to the norms of political society and military organizations. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, Limited Libya, political oversight. Right? Yeah. So yeah. Libya and Syria are probably the best examples of a scenario right now whereby civil disturbances 
do not remain civil. They become international. Both of those things are highly connected to the refugee crisis inside of Europe. All of those things involve massive dimensions with regards towards economic, regional, and international security. So you'll find the UN Security Council heavily involved, but you'll also find local actors heavily involved. So right now there is a proxy war turning slowly into an actual hot war between Turkey and Qatar and Italy in the western portion of the country. France, the UAE, Egypt, and to a lesser extent Saudi Arabia in the eastern portion of the country. And they have hired mercenary groups to engage in activity. Russia is involved in the east. They have the Wagner Group there. They're supposedly a contractor firm that... Let's just say that it's a murky water, and the more I would talk about it, the more I'd fall into Dunning-Kruger. So I'm just going to put it aside, but I will say that it is, it is a shadowy group that involves a very extensive influence of Russia's foreign policy is, um, it's the right way to put it, this is a corporate term, it's been... No, no, I'll just use delegated. It's been delegated to the Wagner Group to act as an agent. So. so so, what's the exact link between the Russian government and the Wagner Group? I mean, is, so, is it the case that so it, it's led by a Russian oligarch who's close to Putin? So that might be oh. one anchoring point. The other one would be that uh, the Wagner Group uh, militia are retired uh, military personnel in the Russian army. Right, so they already received uh, training from, uh, uh, from from the Russian military, uh, and also the the source of the weapons. I must assume is directly from the Russian army, and funding as well, the salaries. Yeah, yeah, I would say that it's not exclusively Russian, but it is Russian enough, and it certainly obeys orders from the Kremlin, such that Turkey is negotiating directly with Putin and his foreign minister in order to try to get the Wagner Group out of Libya. And this is actually an interesting thing because the Wagner Group gets a lot of press, but it's far from the only militia group slash mercenary group active in Libya. For instance, right now we have four active, deadly wars going on in the Middle East. Um, Iraq quieted down, that's why I'm saying four, but you could say five if you want to bring in Iraq. And what is the comparative advantage of a bunch of 20-somethings that spent the last 20 years of their life engaged inside of a civil war, engaged in a regular conflict and normal conflict? So if you're going to look for soldiers, cheap soldiers to employ in conflict, where do you go? And this is actually something that you're seeing with regards towards the use of Syrian militia groups as mercenaries in Libya. Hmm. So Syrians are now fighting wars in Libya. Oh, wow. uh, you're going <laughs> to, and if anything, you should be expecting that to grow into the future because it's pretty massive. So you see a strong interregional and international dimension towards civil conflict. Um, you're going to probably, so the nature of warfare now is that all wars are civil, but all civil wars are international. And all international wars have regional dimensions to them. Uh, it, it's okay. it's really, really, really messy. As in, conflicts aren't simple anymore if they ever were simple. The only simple wars are wars in parts of the world that people deem inconsequential and not worth the money to go in. And right now, there are a lot of people that don't want to get involved in a lot of civil wars, in large part because COVID-19 robbed them of their treasury. They have no more blood and treasure to spend. Because Libya was a proxy war, and it was a proxy war largely funded by Gulf oil money, alongside Russian oil money, which is a very interesting dynamic when you realize that the Libyan conflict is now going on inertia where the control over oil resources is considered a paramount concern and oil isn't worth much at all anymore. So you uh, can't purchase uh, weapons and food uh, yeah. with it, which is what yeah. you need to keep the war going. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you would think that it would slow down, but instead Turkey took this as an opportunity to escalate. Um, well, rewind. It was actually um, after that 
escalated again because he escalates, commits a truce, escalates, commits a truce, and he basically conquered almost all the country at one point. But then Turkey intervened. And when Turkey intervened, well, suddenly all the people that Turkey were trying... Turkey's on the side of the, the GNA, right? Which is not Yeah, yeah. They're on the side of the West. So they were the first major military backing that the UN-supported government actually received. Because the UN government was dying off. Uh, now, this is a rabbit hole, actually. I'm, I'm starting to realize. I'm not sure how much longer I'll talk about Libya before, uh, mm. before we start getting bored. You were talking no. about... You're a foreign policy expert, Dennis. <laughs> You're going to be a good consultant. Wow. Uh, yeah. So, Are you going to go into PhD, uh, international relations studies? Is that where you're, is that, so, is that where you're getting into? Um, my PhD is essentially going to be how to save the how to save democracy. Um, okay. Awesome. awesome. So, so I'm I'm slowly building up to that point. I, I just kept getting lost inside of. Uh, how modern wars yeah. are fought. Modern wars now are rather ridiculous, but. This is the thing. So that's only one way that states engage in competition with one another. Uh, The far more interesting or subversive way that countries engage in competition now is that they target the domestic populations of their rivals or of their targets. And this is in order to create desirable political outcomes inside of those countries. Um, And desirable can mean rabidly opposed to them. So if you're able to effectively eliminate a large amount of the quote-unquote reasonable people in the room, even if the people who hate you are in charge, well, they aren't exactly people who are able to really lead an effective struggle against you. So there are a lot of people that aren't... There are a lot of rivals to the United States that have no idea how to deal with Donald Trump because they don't know whether or not they want to keep an incompetent leader even if they're against them or if they want to try someone else just so they could gain breathing room. This is actually the divide between Russia and China right now. Uh, China China and Russia have different preferences for who should lead the United States, and those different preferences are born from a desire to see whether or not they want a different leader in the White House, even though Joe Biden would lead towards a more stable in a more effective United States. Maybe you don't want the pressure of Donald Trump burning down the entire order in order to make sure. I, I need to establish a few things. I'm realizing that I'm saying things without really establishing why they're important. So the United States under Donald Trump has been engaged in a lot of cornering moves. So his first two years as president have been designed to ensure that he could make a deal's approach to establishing foreign policy. Let's make a deal. Then the deals didn't work. So then it became fire and theory, a lot of threats. So and then they, they threats. talk about the North Korea example where I want to go out, I want to meet Kim Jong-un. Shake but hands. Yeah, <laughs> yeah he, he, he was able to get the photo up, but uh, yeah. then in a negotiation... Nothing actually he, happened. Nothing happened exactly. yeah. Yeah, it was the same thing with China. So Donald Trump went to China. Well, Donald Trump sent his people to China. He met with Xi Jinping later on, and he's like, we're going to make a deal. We're all going to be nice buddy buddies. And of course, Xi Jinping was very supportive of Donald Trump coming there, and they said that they were friends a couple of times. But... Donald Trump overemphasized personal influence, and he thought that people would do it just to make favors with him. And um, no, no, that's not how foreign policy works. So he he allowed himself to be suckered into the point where he now started to think that he was dealing with dishonest actors. So now he's trying to bully everyone into isolating China in a way that um, hasn't been productive. So now you're seeing a change again. So Donald Trump has a lot of changes. And right now you see people like Secretary Esper say that in order to engage in competition with China, we need allies. We need to reinforce a lot of our local partners in Southeast Asia. We need to make sure that we're taking actions in coordination with Europe. So it's 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 this whole thing. Did, 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 did you read the, the Mary Trump uh, biography of her uncle? Uh, so, so Mary Trump obviously is the niece, uh, the nope. I read brother's that. daughter. Uh, no, I, I, re- I read Bolton as well. Um, so, I mean, you, you can maybe go into Bolton. I, I go a little bit into Mary Trump. Uh, so basically, so in about 200 pages or so, uh, Mary Trump uh, basically blames um, Fred Sr. 
uh, Fred Trump, so that's Donald Trump's father. Uh, and uh, so Fred Sr. Uh, was basically uh, a high-functioning sociopath, is the way how Mary, uh, the granddaughter, described uh, him. Uh, and he basically has very high, you could say, ambitions for the children, especially the sons. And the sons are supposed to inherit his business. Um, and uh, so there was a traumatic episode when uh, when Donald was like a small infant. He was three years old. Um, when uh, his mother, uh, that's, uh, I think, Marianne Trump, uh, or, uh, uh, she had uh, a hysterectomy, right? So, uh, so there was uh, like organs were removed from her. Uh, and then she was in the hospital for one year during that period. Uh, so Donald uh, was basically brought up by the nanny uh, and, uh, you know, was sort of missing motherly love. Uh, and then sort of in order to compensate for that, uh, you know, uh, Donald became very intent to please his father, right, um, which is Fred Sr. Uh, Fred Jr., however, uh, that's Mary's father. Uh, Fred Jr. was, uh, you know, he was like a hobby pilot. And then he ended up being a pilot uh, for a few years. Um, but he was a kind person, which in the Trump family, you're not supposed to be kind, you know, even though kind might be associated with, you know, being a normal functioning human being, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, and uh, yeah, Fred Jr. didn't want to do the, the family business, which is to be, you know, like real estate king of uh, in, in New York. Um, and uh, so he, uh, yeah, so he became an alcoholic. Uh, uh, that's Fred Jr. Uh, Fred Jr. died at age, I think, 38 or something, or 42. Mm -hmm. um, and we, when Donald saw that, when he was a young man, uh, he said, you know, I, I don't want to end up like, uh, like my brother. So, uh, so Donald never touched alcohol, so he never became an alcoholic. Um, but, uh, but he took on the, the persona of his father, right? Which is, which, uh, the psychologists call narcissism, right? It's, it's mm -hmm. like, a, it's, it's like a love for oneself. Uh, it's a disregard for other people's feelings. Uh, and then with respect to what, what Dennis mentioned with, with, with the dictators, uh, it's also like the belief that, you know, you can please these, uh, these strong men like Xi Jinping or Kim Jong-un or Vladimir Putin uh, and then thereby magically get a deal, right? Mm -hmm. And then so what's also very interesting is that, uh, which is what Mary Trump describes, uh, which is that, all that they have to do, right, um, the, which is the, the other leaders, uh, is to say nice words, right, to, to sort of ingratiate, ingratiate themselves uh, with Donald Trump. Uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, then, and, then, and then Trump is willing to give away the barn, right? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, he, you know he, he likes to hear, he likes to hear praise. Um, but I mean, but that's the thing of a narcissist too, right? It's like even if you hear all that praise, you know, it's never enough, right? That, that, that's that's why the title of Mary Trump's book was "Too Much and Never Enough." Um, and uh, yeah, and then so that that that's the thing. So that, that's so the, the psychology element that Mary Trump is a learned psychologist, has a PhD in psychology. Um, you know, I, I I think that's that's like just a small element behind that, uh, yeah. which is very important though in in the context of U.S. politics because obviously he's a commander in chief, right? <laughs> uh, Larry, I always thought that the persona of uh, Trump is very close to also Nixon. You know, Nixon had also very uh, he was paranoid uh, too. Yeah. Well, yeah, cynicism, but also real politics oriented, but uh, anti. Uh, empathy oriented, anti empathy oriented. So it's the, the style of politics and the symbolism, you know, the aggressiveness. 
So you're right. That has a social psychological dimension. So I don't know if we can use an ideal type model and say that it, it persists uh, for uh, people on the left or on the right. You know, there's similar characters throughout history. You know, if we think of uh, people that have displayed similar behavior. Okay. You know, there's an old um, book written by Ardono uh, in the Frankfurt School, The Authoritarian Personality Theory. I don't know if you all know about that one. I've been uh, noticing uh, people have tried to use that theory to link it to uh, this um, tweeting behavior of Trump, some of the tweets that he often makes, some of the cruel, you know, uh, jokes that he makes, that it goes back to this authoritarian personality type. Like you said, narcissistic and uh, anti-empathetic, uh, showing no empathy, um, yeah, it, uh, conformity-oriented things like that, hostility towards others that are non-conforming to him. Uh, so maybe it's also gender. I don't know. Maybe it's some kind of uh, toxic masculinity. I don't know. Uh, some gender theorists will use that phrase, toxic masculinity. Yeah, but, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I wouldn't go into toxic masculinity. But but but, but yeah, it's 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 it, it's a very you know you're right. It, social. We can use the social psychological explanation. Uh, he is a different class. You know, he's upper. Up, you know, where would you put him? Upper class. Yeah. Upper class, yeah. He's uh, been kind of insulated uh, his his life. He's been around very affluent uh, people. He's privileged, obviously. If you yeah. look at some of the pictures of his living lifestyle. Uh, again, I'm not trying to stereotype, but it seems yeah, very I, upper bourgeois. I, I, yeah. I, I think we should analyze it also yeah. from the perspective of the voters, right? Right, right, there, right, there's, right. There's something about, as you say, the, the authoritarian personality, you could say, among the voters uh, who sort of uh, like these kinds of people, like Nixon or Trump, um, which is that, you know, I guess the word is chuspa, right? Like, I mean, a guy who is like really courageous right to sort of you know call out uh, people make fun of them you know when, when he said to clinton oh my, you know look at this slob or you know who would vote for her you know and I, lock her up i yeah. mean it's it's very it's it requires some choose but he has it right and uh, well uh, and the authoritarian personality types uh they're sort of very attracted to that oh that sounds great a guy who yeah. says screw you to the political system Right, the the stuff the media earlier, yeah, the, the, glo the losers of the globalization, you know, like who 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 feel like somebody is standing up for them, you know, somebody is speaking on their behalf, you know, and uh, throwing bombs at the uh, at at the political establishment, and it feels good, you know, uh, and, and that's the residual support that Trump has. I mean, thirty five to forty percent of the American electorate. Um, which, uh, you know, he would basically have to hold. I mean, I guess you'd have to get to more than 45% if he wants to win it. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, that, that, that's, that, that's, the, that's the allure. And, and you're right. It's the, yep. Maybe we can, um, and I mean, it's not just authoritarian personality theory, but just the general theory of uh, populist, you know, and that can go both, we could see it more visibly to the right side. Hungary, right, uh, for an example, and Austria and other uh, populists mm -hmm. uh, know how to play with words and they pick particular themes that are very simple, very dichotomous, you know, they're very simplified. It's almost like a Carl Schmitt worldview. You know, politics is just uh, finding like, uh, an enemy. Or a friend. You have a friend or an enemy. That's the whole political strategy. There's nothing else to it. You always need to have an enemy uh, image or an enemy target, and then then you just have friends, right? So um, I think that's why populists are appealing because it's just so sim simple. You know, it's not technocratic. It's not uh, based on any uh, way to verify. That's why lying becomes appealing too. You know. Um, it's kind of manufactured consensus, you know. I don't know. What do y'all think? I'm throwing it out there. It's, that's maybe Chomsky. But uh, what do y'all think about that uh, populist strategy? Is it? Uh, and it's very anti-democratic. It, it it doesn't go through the regular democratic process, of, right? This one person has all the answers, right? 
I mean, I, I, I like the Schmittian framework. I mean, yeah. it's uh, your <laughs> politics about fighting enemies. I mean, and, and that's yeah. that's a extremely cynical, but of course, for you know, policy wonks like myself on the on the left, uh, right? I mean, we have this sort of idealist vision. I mean, like Bernie Sanders and Andrew Yang, people like that have that too. Elizabeth Warren, which is basically we think that politics is about doing good, right? Like benefiting the population, you know, uh, improving people's standard of living, economic security, and things like that. Uh, but it's clearly that's not uh, that's not the only conception of politics. Uh, mm -hmm. And those who who go on the on the Schmittian in the Schmittian route of uh, fighting enemies, uh, they 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 generally win out, uh, especially if the sort of the the policy wonk, uh, you know, people on the left uh, they don't deliver, right? Mm -hmm. And we're not able to deliver because you know we <laughs> we we surrender to neoliberalism, right? It's like a yeah. It's like yeah. a collective surrender. I mean, we say oh, oh, anti-intellectualism too. We're, you know, we have to fight that too. Yeah, it's like the the only thing that we on the left are really pushing back against. I mean, is uh, is, is 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 our what our narrow niche uh, concern is, right? So, in, in like recently, the the rule to bar foreign students uh, when they take uh, online only courses, uh, and of course, then. We in the academic community, we get highly activated about this, right? And we have to fight that, you know. Um, and it's great for us, but, you know, we, we don't really have this. Like, we don't really have a vision where we say, go vote for it. And, uh, one exception, however, is, uh, is, is I think, the Andrew Yang, you know, like, the, you know, vote, vote for a thousand bucks a month. And I think, uh, like, Basically, if the Democratic yeah. Party... Yeah. If the Democratic Party had relented to that, I think, uh, you know, I, I, I think there would have been a good alternative vision. Right, definitely. That's yes. on, on our side. Yeah. But, um, uh, I don't know what I can add. Anything else you want to add, Dennis? Is there anything, uh, comments or anything that we went too far with our <laughs> analysis? Uh, well, um, I'm curious what your opinion is on UBI, though. I never got your position on UBI. Could that be uh, saving the world's problem if we just had universal basic income implemented? Uh, I wouldn't. Yeah. It, well, you're more of a realist there. You don't you know, all of that. that. That's that's one way to put it. I believe in no utopian frameworks, uh, but I do think that UBI would be a highly useful tool for ensuring societal, societal and economic sustainability moving forward particularly for those areas that are distant from concentrations of capital. Um, so the closer you are to concentrated areas of wealth, the less useful UBI will be for you, which is why some people are proponents of MBI. But um, yeah, that, that's a distinction that. that I'm not even going to really get right. into. Uh, with regards towards populism, um, yeah. Yeah. I, I am, hey. I'm hesitant to say it because that was my master's thesis. Oh, but, wow. I've got 130 pages somewhere written about that, and uh, oh, well, wow. you can give us a two paragraph version of it. Yeah, the, the two paragraph version of it. Did we uh, get it right? No, <laughs> we're all topic. Uh, so, the definition of populism that you're using is very common. Um, it's basically the dominant prevailing view. I have a little bit more of a Galston approach towards it. Um, so William, uh, no, not William, Walston, Gal oh, oh no, I forgot his first name. It starts with a W. Well, it should be William, but it could be something else. But Galston, he um, wrote a book. And my underlying belief system is closer in line towards his, uh, which is that populism emerges in order to correct, uh, in order to correct a perceived failing of the political institutions regardless of whether or not the perception is true, it's meant to respond to that. So why do people like Trump and why do people like Bernie Sanders? The reason for it is there is the very strong belief that something in this country has gone fundamentally wrong. And the experts are seeming to perpetuate the system 
rather than pose any substantial challenge towards it. So instead, people reach out and they look for challengers. And challengers that are against the experts of the system are typically not well liked by media sources. They're typically not well liked by institutional parties. They're typically villainized by the press. So therefore, you have an instant team maker. This person is hated by all the people I don't trust anymore. Therefore, I support him. He's willing to call out all of the people that need to be called out and aren't being called out by other people. Therefore, I support him. And that bestows a very large amount of loyalty. Now, there is definitely a Manichaean divide um, that's into this one, a Manichaean politics, an us versus them like component. Um, you could certainly bring in some Carl Schmidt too. Uh, I remember during our first podcast, you brought up mm. Carl Schmidt and you're like, your ideas remind me of Carl Schmidt. And, and my mm. reaction was, the Nazi? <laughs> like that's the jurist. That's he was jurist. Yeah. Was he lawyer? That, that is and... not what. That is. That's not what anyone wants to hear. I made that joke, and and Larry started getting frustrated. Like, no, 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 nothing to do with that. Talking about his ideas, I'm like, okay, all right, but um, <laughs> but yeah. So I would definitely say that it's meant to be a corrective element to democracy in such a way that it's responding to a perception, and perceptions are guided by broader narrative constructs in society. And whether or not those broader narrative constructs in society are true, false, or partially true, um, there's the strong undercurrent of the... My entire screen just changed for a second. I have no it's idea. Right. Let me go right back to you. We can see, we can see you. So, sure. so the underlying premise behind this one is that you're seeing people participate in... A narrative framework that's orientating them to the political system. What is a Trump supporter? A Trump supporter is not, I hate women, I hate minorities, I am a fan of authoritarians, and I am right. just waiting to become a fascist. Right. That is something that you seem to that's something that seems to be gaining increasing acceptance among some of the more progressive circles, but that has nothing to do with being a Trump supporter. A Trump supporter is someone who, and, and I'm going to speak from personalized anecdotal experience, as well as some Jonathan Haidt framework stuff here. So I, I highly recommend people take a look at Jonathan Haidt. And he's one of the best, yeah, he's one of the best um political psychologist or moral psychologist that I've come across in a very long time. He wrote a book called The Righteous Mind. But the stereotypical Trump supporter is someone who has either lost a job or knows someone who has. Someone who's increasingly pessimistic about the fate of their country. Someone who believes that people who live in highly urbanized and educated settings have no strong sense of attachment, loyalty, or duty to their country, such that if it ever came time for a war where the nation was attacked, they would call for peace or conscientiously object rather than joining the military and fighting for the country. There are people who have a sense of reverence for the idea of the nation, the history of the nation, and the objects of the nation. So you're going to find a lot of people who really like the Constitution, who really like the flag, who really like the trappings of American nostalgia. Because pro nativist, right? It gives yeah. emotional stability. Yeah, it's it's not even just emotional stability. It is this is as important to me as ensuring that we have welfare in this country. It is the idea that moral goodness, moral value, the integrity of the nation is more than just its people. It is also the contents of their ideas and how those ideas manifest themselves in the country. So they're typically nativist, but they're also traditionalist. They have a great degree of reverence for the idea of a religious place in society, even if they disagree with religion. So Trump supporters are increasingly becoming secular or atheistic or non-traditional in their orientation, even if even in what is this strange? We got your message. Yeah, mm -hmm. something kept popping up. So I'm. But they're definitely anti-intellectual, right? 
<laughs> they're anti-intellectual. They're anti-intellectual yeah. because they do not trust the institutions that produce intellectuals. Yeah. So here's a very intuitive example on how to understand a Trump supporter. Do you trust ExxonMobil's global warming papers from the 1990s and early 2000s? Why don't you trust them? They come from very well-regarded institutions. Many of them have very good credentials. They have a lot of data. A lot of it is apparently peer-reviewed, or at the very least what counts as peer review for their industry. Why don't you trust it? Well, the reason why you don't trust it is they're being funded by oil. The positions that they come up with are supporting traditional oil interests. And there is other information out there that contradicts that, or at the very least recontextualizes it. And ExxonMobil eventually did back off. They're now actually supporters of the idea of global climate change. Very big investors in green energy. If you want to take a look at the largest investors in green energy, they are traditional oil companies. So they made their 180, but a lot of people don't trust with, that. With a little greenwashing, yeah. <laughs> well, well, yeah. I mean, they definitely need to try. Uh, be, because they, they understand that something happened, and now they're going to... Yeah. They, they've made the transition to say we're going to be the green energy producers of the future yeah. because a big change happened. So why does the Trump supporter come across as anti-intellectual? It's because the intellectuals that they see are produced by academias. They don't really trust the university system nearly as much. They have a suspicion that all of it is driven by not not a not a tr true as true as too iffy of a word, but it's they have a very strong suspicion of certain elements of the humanities inside of universities. They wonder why people think that a gender studies degree, which is the common stereotype that gets thrown around, why people who spend four years learning how to hate their country expect to be able to get out and get a very nice job doing something well obtaining no practical skills while inside of the university. Now, they do have a strong degree of reverence for specific kinds of intellectuals. It's anti-intellectualism, but it's anti-intellectualism with regards towards the academia. When it comes towards people like Elon Musk, uh, people that they think view of as successful in society. People who create things. The yeah. Engineers. The creative creative yeah. class, right? So creative generate generative generative idea producing people so the people behind google the people behind amazon the people behind um, spacex or tesla there's a very strong degree of respect for that peter thiel is widely respected in a lot of circles inside of conservatives and there's also a another mounting thing is is that traditional center left or left academias uh, academicians i'll just say professors uh, traditional left-wing professors that oppose what is seen as the perception of a bad shift in the modern university are also very well loved. So Jonathan Haidt is actually respected by a lot of Trump supporters, but also you'll find people like Jordan B. Peterson instantly getting a lot of support. Nicholas Nassim Taleb gets a lot of support. There's a large number of people. Uh, Neil Ferguson comes to mind as well. These are conservatives or center-left people that become prominent in conservative press. So the Weinsteins also come to mind. So um, uh, Eric, Eric Weinstein, and what's oh, the other one's the name? Yeah, Eric and Brett. Brett Weinstein. Yeah, those are also very well liked. Um, Eric is a left-wing economist with a PhD from MIT or Harvard, I forget which. And Brett Weinstein was a well, Bernie well, Sanders promoting professor of evolutionary biology inside of a small state college. These people gained national prominence amongst traditional Trump wings conservatives uh, because of what they perceive as people who are the only true representations of the old left that was respectable in a world that's gone amok. As in, the narrative that they believe they're inhabiting is a country that's going off the rails that no longer has any strong basis in what it used to be America, and they just see a group that's critiquing and destroying. So I actually know people in my own family who are Trump supporters who believe in their bones, in their gut, that the Democratic Party is trying to destroy this country. And that's why they support Trump. 
because they believe that it's not just a different political party. It's an entire system set up against them. Because the Democratic Party only listens to the gender studies, uh, left BLM, left wing Marxists, whatever, and they're going to destroy the. Yeah, uh, and the Democrats yeah. that they look to are never the ones that oppose that. It's always the ones that are vocally in support of it. So it's a very different narrative. For instance, they believe that some of the worst elements of the riots inside of Seattle and Portland are the future of this country if Donald Trump doesn't get reelected. They believe that Donald Trump is the tsunami wall, the dike preventing a storm from overcoming their entire world. It doesn't matter that none of it's true. Yeah, it's not true. At the very least, it's, it's a warped representation of the And also, what's very, very important to, to mention here in this 2020 context is that, you know, Joe Biden, uh, he's, a, you could say, he's a basement campaigner, right? Uh, which, of course, I mean, it's related to the pandemic, obviously. Yep. Uh, but, but the fact that, you know, he, he's a basement campaigner, I mean, I think it's the purpose, right? The fact that, let me not say too much about the current cultural war, you know, that revolves around the, the, the Portland protests, etc. Uh, and, uh, or, you know, police brutality and these concerns. Uh, and let me just, let me just sit back, shut up, and uh, hope that enough Americans are uh, shocked and outraged by the poor handling of the pandemic, which of course is happening because we have over 160,000 people dead uh, and counting uh, and 5 million infections or so. Um, and, you know, so it's really capitalizing on the pandemic where mm -hmm. prior to February, March, you know, you could say there was a 50 50 chance. And, Biden Trump, but now I think uh, I, I, I think the, I think the balance is shifting slightly towards Biden. I mean, I, I wouldn't you know put a lot of money into knowing that he's definitely going to win it, right? But uh, but 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 the chances are now in, into his favor, and I think the fact that he didn't you know well he spoke out a little bit about. Uh, the culture uh, conflict stuff, but uh, not too much. Uh, and I think it was on purpose. I think he, I think he knows that. Like, okay, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna wade into very dangerous territory where you know, like, I could get you know, uh, sort of this, you know, the, the 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 Trump voters to actually show up, all of them, right? And that's that that's what that, that that's what Biden doesn't want. Yeah. And then the same argument about like, okay, well, why would you appoint Kamala Harris, who is one of the sort of center right when it comes to being like law on law enforcement? Yeah, she was uh, when she was Attorney General in California. You know, she increased uh, incarceration and stuff. Uh, and the answer is that well, if you are like a center right Republican, like a Colin Powell type, you know, like a Jeb Bush type. You know, you're not going to hate Kamala Harris, right? Like you're not like you you like you can't you can't hit her on being. I mean, you know, there's some attempts now to 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 paint her as a left wing Marxist, but it's not convincing, right? Her no. father, right, wrote something. Well, her father's a Marxist, yeah. Yeah, he wrote something. Uh, uh, but, 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 Donald but, Harris, Stanford yeah. economist. Uh, Donald Harris, yeah, but 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 to paint Kamala Harris as as being like a left wing crazy and uh, you know resulting in burning cities and stuff like that, uh, that that's not working. And I think that's I, I think that that was a big part of of of, of putting Kamala Harris on the ticket, right? Yeah, yeah. I would buy that one hundred percent. In large part because there's an entire movement to try to get Biden elected from the Republican Party now. The yeah. establishment is in revolt. At least the establishment in exile is. So um, Republicans for Biden is a emerging mm -hmm. prospect. Um, something like 
10 to 15 percent of Republicans uh, have left the party and are intending to join the Democratic Party. Now, of course, the politically relevant question is yeah. whether that margin of swing, right, is going to be is going to be sufficient to offset the losses of the of the progressive voters in the Democratic Party. I mean, I've got no idea, and it also needs to be geographically concentrated. So, progressive wings inside of the Democratic Party are typically in certain areas, but. Also, the neocons, um, the the defecting, the defecting Republicans. So the Bush administration folks, they are also not really people you'll find in purple states. They're usually people you'll find in D.C. Mm-hmm. or you'll find them in deep red states. So what happens there? You're looking for the most amount of utility you can gain from certain elements of the big the Midwest, certain areas of the Mid Atlantic. In Florida, and uh, well, I that's have absolutely no idea if that's where they are. Mm. I, I have a different uh, prognosis. I, when I look at the uh, decision, uh, you know, Biden and Harris, it, it, like you said, Larry, it's, it's, it's a centrism, a centrist uh, third way, and it, to some way, it's a strategy. You could say it could, it could really uh, be used by Democrats. Uh, to widen their base and uh, to defuse the way that historically American politics kind of operates is in this cultural war kind of battles. You know, the term cultural wars, you know, it was uh, coined by uh, James Hunter in 1991, where he thought that the core bread and butter of American politics was this fighting between you know, traditionalists and secular liberalists. And I'm wondering if this diffuses it, you know, the Biden-Harris uh, ticket kind of diffuses that culture war and you can't make it binary anymore, right? It's kind of, like you said, it's in between, you know? Like, for instance, where would you put gun voters on this ticket? Uh, would gun voters reject uh, Biden and Harris uh, on other issues, you know? I mean, I don't know. Can you really, you know... I'm raising that question because it doesn't fit. It doesn't fit into this polarized us and them. So it maybe that's a strategy that could work out for the Democrats because it's right third way kind of intermediary, right? So I, I, I don't would know. definitely yeah. I would definitely agree with that. Uh, but yeah. that's only if you're assuming that that's how people see it. Right. They so, may they interpret it differently. Yeah. Yeah. So may, yeah. the Biden Kamala uh, ticket probably has Biden Harris ticket has two or three main issues that I see with it. The first one is that Biden's presidential campaign right now is the most progressive campaign that has ever existed inside of the history of the United States run by a major presidential party as in the, well, maybe not the history. So we still have Franklin Delano Roosevelt, but as far as living memory is concerned, his candidacy is to the left of Clinton, is to the left of Obama, is to the left of the earlier Clinton. It's to the left even of people like Michael Dukakis. So this is very much a campaign that has tried its best to make its peace with the progressive wing. Its VP pick was not in that arrangement, but the campaign itself is. Um, so that's one way to look at this. Whether or not that's enough to make it radical Marxist is whatever, but... The progressive wing doesn't buy that the Biden ticket is genuine in its adoption of progressive platforms. So right now we're talking about um, Biden-Harris as a centrist, opening, moderate, trying to expand the base. And I'm 100 percent in favor of that. And I think that's what's being done. Especially but, the Midwest, you know. Yeah. I think in the Midwest. Uh, oh. I'm I'm 100% with you. It's just that I think that plenty of Bernie Sanders supporters thinks that no matter what Biden actually says, he's not a progressive and none of these policy decisions are going to happen, which is part of the reason why Larry probably said that will the gain in centrists and Republicans offset the loss in progressives? Because no matter how progressive Biden tries to be or is, he's not an actual progressive with the bona fides of, say, Bernie Sanders. So no matter how far to the left he goes, I don't think people are going to buy it. That's the first concern. The second concern is that 
a lot of people are taking a look at their traditional Democratic Party and the traditional Republican Party and thinking of them as the enemies of the current system. Um, so a lot of people are just going to say, OK, you're trying to return to normal, but normal hasn't worked for us. Uh, we Third way, third way. Independence, is that what you're getting at? Y yeah. Okay. Not just third, way, third party, I'm sorry. Third party. Yeah, yeah, but not even just that. It's also the underlying populist critique, which is the idea that there's something about the way that things are being done now that isn't working and isn't serving the people. Therefore, you need someone to break the system in order to make sure that it is reinvented to support the people. And you see this in um, progressive and um, populist Republican rhetoric all the time, which is the system needs to be taken down, the swamp needs to be drained, you need a transformation of society, uh, real change. Everyone wants real change. And one thing that a lot of people I suspect would believe is that Biden-Harris is not real change. It's a return yeah. to normalcy. And a lot of people don't want us to return to normal. They want us to go one way or the other. And then the third critique is that I don't actually think that a lot of people who are Trump supporters are in a position to think of Biden and Harris as centrists. Because if they think that Biden and Harris are centrists, then something about their core narrative logic about America is wrong. So I think it's far more easy for them to rationalize it and say, OK, maybe they're not crazy progressives, but sleepy Joe Biden is going to die within the first two years of office. And that leaves Kamala Harris. And um, I'm not sure I like Harris. Uh, one of the critiques that a lot of people have is that she's a wine mom. Uh, I have no idea why that's a critique, but it's common in Twitter, at least. Mm -hmm. And um, another critique that people have is that uh, she's tough on crime, um, which a lot of people don't really like, although Republicans sort of do like that. But a lot of people are skeptical of her because she's from California. A lot of people are skeptical of her because she, when she was running for president, engaged in some of the identity politics stuff. Um, she was against Joe Biden, saying that she believed a lot of the a lot of the accusations against um, Joe Biden by what was her name, Tara Reid? I want to say it's Tara Reid, but it might be someone else. Um, so a lot of people will start thinking of her, of her almost as a two faced politician or something. Well, being a normal politician. Something. Yeah, they're, they're going to try to think of something. So if they can't say that she's a Marxist, then they're going to try to find some other way of discrediting her and thinking. Birthier, her the Bursier conspiracy. conspiracy, right? The. Uh claim that her parents uh, were foreign-born, so that makes her disqualified. Yeah, I mean, okay. uh, That's a new conspiracy theory. Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm sure that some conspiracy will end up getting some Donald traction Trump's from this election. in Scotland, so what, you know? Yeah. yeah. Well, like, what I'm, what I'm getting at here is that yeah. there's going to be something that's going to happen, so I don't actually think that a lot of Trump supporters will ever actually realize or recognize the Biden-Harris ticket as probably one of the strongest shows of reconciliation that they could ask for. Because ultimately, that's what I think the Biden campaign has been doing. Uh, it's made several feelers to some members of the Republican Party. A lot of people are supporting them. Max Boot, after he left the um, Republican Party, said that he was no longer in the Republican Party because it's not really conservative anymore, but he's going to support a traditional Democratic Party and there were several op-eds that said, please, Democratic Party, don't push me away. I want to vote for you. Um, because quite a large number of them were very concerned about Bernie Sanders winning the election because then they would vote for no one or they'd vote for Trump rather than voting for the Democrats. So there's a problem that I'm thinking of whereby people on the Republican Party might not ever actually make the switch to thinking of Harris and Biden as a centrist opportunity. So maybe they might not think of them as progressives or Marxists or postmodern neo Marxists. They'll instead think of it as something still far less desirable than this man has our backs, he's going to bring back our jobs, and he's going to defend our country when other people will not. So I don't, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I, I really want Biden and Harris to win. 
I, 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 I really so want to I mean, I think everybody in the academic community is very much <laughs> yeah, yeah, like, 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 I really want them you to win. Not a foreign student visa fiasco, you know. Uh, I, I do want to ask y'all too, because um, Texas, Texas, as you know, is a major state, and I'm in it. Uh, it's been a red state since. Uh, it, it's Ann a Richards. state in the polls now, right? Well, it's 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 very unique. The cities have historically, the major cities have historically gone lean towards Democrats, but the rural areas definitely have been strongly Republican. Uh, it's what's one of those toss up. I really do not know uh, what will happen. But what's your prognosis? A state like Texas, you know, uh, the size of it. Do you think uh, Biden Harris have a chance, or you think it's still going to go Trump? I'm curious what y'all thoughts are. Um, I'm still kind of. I don't know. I mean, there's some really diehard Trump people. I mean, I see the signs around the neighborhood here, you know. Uh, it's, they're still putting up their signs. So I don't know uh, if this will play out between cities and rural areas. Uh, I think that's really what's at war. I think that the area, the zip code that you live often determines maybe your voting, uh, unless, unless there's a turnaround. I don't know, at the ballot box. Yeah, population or, density. Yeah codes are one of the largest yeah predictors of what's yeah. going to happen it's not race it's not even class it's zip code, right? density what do you want to just throw it up toss up just make a guess you think uh trump or uh, biden harris state uh, of texas I, I, that's, they, a larry, that's a larry statement you go first <laughs> what do you think just well, I, would, I, I would think it's probably going to stay republican oh. uh, and uh, i mean I, I i think i think the the path to victory for uh, for Joe Biden is Florida, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Midwest. Uh, yeah, Midwest. Yeah, Wisconsin. I I, I think those four states, uh, and then maybe North Carolina is also in play, perhaps. Yeah. Um, yeah, four or five states. I think they're gonna make they're gonna make and break the election, right? Yeah. Dennis, what's your take? I, Texas? I think that I think that Texas has the potential to turn blue but oh, wow. i don't think that its potential is born from a substantive shift in the underlying politics of texas i think it might have more to do with a growing mistrust of the trump administration itself um so part of the reason why i think um ted cruz part of the reason why i think beto o'rourke did as well as he did is because he was going against ted cruz and part of the reason why I think Biden Harris will do as well as they will do is because they're going against Trump. But I would be strongly, strongly skeptical of that meaning that, oh, Texas is going to be a purple state from now on. No, mm -hmm. I think that's more 10, 20 years down the line, assuming that no changes happen underneath the surface. Okay. Good. And with regards towards putting any emphasis at all in winning Texas. If I was in the Biden campaign, I would say, not on your life. Every penny goes to key battleground states. Mm -hmm. Texas might go purple, but if Texas goes purple or blue in this election, I would expect several other states that are also very Republican to do the same. I mean, Arizona started to look like it was going blue for a little while. Not anymore. Oh. I, I have a feeling that things will change and i can't help but feel like everything was related to the COVID uh, infection yeah yeah right? it's the pandemic i yeah. cannot wow. believe that it's the mask thing the whole mask the it's... mask conspiracy theorists or what well are <laughs> driving the republican party now <laughs> you know the think? mistrust of certain academies of certain yeah. people based on politics mm -hmm. the trump has a lot of doctors it believes Mm -hmm. It's just that all of the doctors they believe are, are laughed out by people on CNN and other areas, and that just makes them want to screw them even more. So there was the doctors for uh, no masks or doctors for ending quarantine rally inside of D.C. Uh, there was a migrant doctor that said that she treated 300 patients or 350 patients with a mixture of hydroxychloroquine, zinc, and one other medicine, and that they all recovered. She said that it's a treatable disease, that we're moving forward, and that things are going to be nice and peaceful. And she was talking about how she thanked God for her guidance in her life. And that's something that a lot of conservatives will be like, okay, so this is a religious person saying that 
her treatment works, and she's a doctor, and she saved a lot of lives. Let's listen to her. And then immediately afterwards, people were starting to talk about how, oh, she believes in demons. She has a ridiculous metaphysical framework that's not just, I might believe in God, but maybe she's also an evangelical. Maybe she believes in some of the myths that are inside of Christianity. She's clearly not trustworthy. She's a discredited doctor, and anyone who believes her is a quack. And they started asking Facebook to take down her videos. I can tell you right now that in the Trump community, that went off about as quietly as an atom bomb. Because people started sharing her videos around a lot. And people started thinking that there was a concentrated effort by people to silence her in order to ensure that people were instead following the comfortable narrative. And what they would bring up is that here's something that you'd also just falling into the Republican rejection of masks and institutional authority. Cuomo in New York was widely praised early on in the pandemic. But he did a lot of questionable things while he was doing this. And one of them was, yeah, making mandatory sick people going into nursing homes and rehabilitation centers. So people who were fresh out of surgeries, very vulnerable, were being put into the same wards as people with coronavirus. And a lot of them died. So their response is the Democratic Party is trying to kill off the old people because they... It's it's a bit it's it's more than a bit ridiculous, but when you follow the chain of logic and you think of enough data points and you think of enough questionable decisions, their response is, "I'm going to live my life the way that I choose. If I want to go to a store, I shouldn't have to wear a mask, and I can't trust the local government to take care of me because masks were not encouraged at first, as in the Government, as in... Because there was a scarcity of masks. Uh, there was a scarcity of masks, hospital. but there was an open level of deceit saying that you just needed to wear gloves. Masks were not helpful. And a lot of places said that you don't need to wear masks. Masks aren't helpful. So to people who have long memories, who remember hearing that masks aren't helpful, there are those that said right away, no, masks are helpful. I'm going to wear them. And then there are people who said, oh, I guess masks aren't needed. And then later on, when masks started to become needed, they said, why, how can I trust you? The same people are telling me two things at once. And how am I going to go about this? Then there's also the hydroxychloroquine fiasco. Mm. So there were two scientific papers that came out saying that hydroxychloroquine has no benefit for treating COVID-19. And both papers were forced to be retracted almost right away because in the American system, there's a very strong suspicion of hydroxychloroquine. And I can't help but feel like that suspicion is because Trump keeps putting it forward. But in Europe and in certain parts of the global south, hydroxychloroquine is still used. Uh, it was a French it was a French research center that uh, put forward the call for data that eventually got one of the papers rescinded in the first place. Um, so a lot of people... So science becomes politicized. Is, is, There's is a very strong politicization of science. And the politicization of science means that you're going to find people who are supportive of the science and a lot of people who are not supportive of that science. And this becomes a climate change debate. It's not, it's not necessarily a, I believe in a bunch of conspiracy theories, so I'm a wacko. It is the world has changed so much in the past few months and there's a startling lack of consistency, and enough people are being discredited that I trust, and enough people I trust, lot, enough people that I don't trust have been wrong for me to completely just wipe my hands of it. And you're going to find a lot of people very similar to those that said, well, in the 1970s, people thought we were going to have an ice age, therefore global warming isn't real, uh, which is pretty common. I'm Probably more common in Texas, but it's common up here in rural Massachusetts. Yeah, there's a lot of flat earth believers. Yeah. Uh, people that believe in flat but, earth. But by the way, I, I actually, that's the kernel to authoritarian society. I mean, the yeah. point that Mike earlier brought up, right, where uh, there was a passage, I think, in Hannah Arendt's uh, book 
Origins of, of totalitarianism, right? Totalitarianism, yeah. exactly. Where she says basically that the ideal subject in an authoritarian society isn't the sort of burning nationalist who, who waves the Nazi flag, right? Or the, or the Soviet flag or whatever. Um, but rather the person who doesn't know what's right and wrong, right? Because of the fundamental distrust of the, of the media, the mainstream media, the political institutions, the parties, uh, you know, the corporations, whatever, right? So it's basically in a world where I don't trust any of these institutions. Uh, and, uh, and in that world, you know, I'm going to basically pick my favorite conspiracy theorist, right? Because everybody's a liar anyway, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, and but, no, you're right. Uh, absolutely right, uh, Larry. I think what happens with these mass debates and uh, questioning uh, legitimacy of uh, experts is really, like you said, politicization of science and weaponization. It's the old problem of the who, how, the, maybe a group of individuals or political actors want to maintain the monopoly of truth. Right. And if you contain the monopoly of truth, then you have control. As soon as you, uh, you know, people question your your uh, definition of truth, right, undermines their authority. So I think if you really observe the behavior of Trump at, at his press conferences, he often just walks away. He doesn't even sometimes allow people to ask him serious questions. He just walks straight away because it undermines his monopoly of truth. He wants to contain the truth right. and experts sometimes challenge so, it. So, so when he twitters, I mean, nobody comes. Yeah, in, right. It's 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 like a strategy. I think I think um, it's an old strategy of just maintaining the monopoly of truth. And most, I mean, it's it's a legacy in totalitarian systems. But if you're able to control the information flow, if you're do, do not allow you know, uh, outside questions, you, you cut off reporters, you just keep talking and keep talking and keep talking, then you, you maintain the monopoly of truth. I mean, it's just that simple. It's an old strategy. And even communist regimes would do that quite often. If they didn't like descendants, they would just cut them off or kill them, you know? So, I mean, dead bodies. It, yeah, it's, it's a main maintenance of the monopoly of truth. Now, one thing I wanted to add, uh, because uh, I've been reading back more and more. What's really fascinating is this whole issue of uh, masks and who takes, who is responsible ultimately here. You know, we keep pushing it around. Think about the responsibility of uh, a mask requirement or uh, who makes the, 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 the medical policy in the United States, right? So the, when we keep pushing it around, the question is who's responsible for it? ultimately. And I think that, that that's what defines risk. In a risk society, everybody claims they're not responsible for it, and everybody, it just keeps pushing it around. You know, it goes from the political, that jumps to the uh, expert, sorry, my hand's over the cam. Uh, in a risk society, like Beck said, I just, had, an, I just yeah. had a guest inside, so I no, looked more ridiculous uh, for two seconds. No, what I was thinking here is, uh, what do y'all think about this, that in the modern institutions, you look at, you observe modern societies, who does take responsibility for stuff? You know, it, it gets pushed around. It goes for, it goes from the expert the system. Burden. You know what I mean? It, it goes from the the, the the medical institution. It goes maybe the media. And it goes. So who is responsible for being responsible? You know, who, who's who, who's in charge, really? Right? It's something like COVID nineteen. I mean, it, it gets pushed around. You know, it's like. Uh, okay, then we have experts on TV, right? And, and the the state doesn't really want to take responsibility. You know, they give they give protocols, they give guidelines, and and then it gets pushed off to another uh, entity. Do, do, you you have, do you have this like uh, Walter Cronkite yeah. nostalgia, as I call this, right? What, right. What, what, what is it? What is it? The the, the, the Walter Cronkite nostalgia, right? Which is uh, yeah. So, so he was uh, like a like <laughs> a at CBS, right? Yeah. No, I'll tell you what, I'll make it easier for y'all, right? I'm going to read off this passage, just where I got it from. You want to know, it's page 149, right? World Risk Society, right? Okay. Where he's trying to, he has, he has, he's trying to like put together this uh, Risk Society idea. And yeah, this is one paragraph. He asks, uh, who is to define and determine the harmlessness of products, the danger, the risks? Where does the responsibility lie with those who generate the risks? 
those who benefit from them, those who are potentially affected by them, or with public agencies, right? So, and that's on page 149. So think about it. Like, the state doesn't want to take a responsibility. The, 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 eco the economic institutions don't want to take responsibility. It's like a blame game. You know, they shift it around. So then who ultimately uh, takes the responsibility with something like this? You know, like, think about how they were going after uh, the World Health Organization. You know, there was all these conspiracy theories. Oh, they're pro-China, and so we should defund them. They're a uh, bias. Uh, Which is the craziest thing if you think yeah. about it, because you need yeah. a global cooperation with uh, drug research and yeah, uh, you know yeah. how to contain the pandemic. Uh, yeah, yeah. So it, I think if you really look at it, it, it's a manufactured risk. It's kind of it's kind of odd because some of the indecisions that institutions make by by this I mean they don't make decisions. They make they shift it to something else and they push it. Well, that's not really our responsibility. I think there was a time when they asked Trump at a press conference, uh, well, should we produce more masks? Should we invoke this uh, act or something, you know, that allowed the government to take over the means of production, I think, for some mm -hmm. sectors? And he was like, well, that's not really the responsibility of government. That should be a private thing. And we're going to try to get some masks, but uh, we're, not, we're not in the business of getting masks, right? And I was thinking, that's, that's, a, that's an example of what is the risk, who, who is responsible, ultimately. And, and uh, if we don't, right, if you don't have uh, governance in place, then you have these problems, right? Um, okay, that's all I wanted to say about the risk society. <laughs> well, yeah. Y'all have to read, y'all have to read about it. Y'all have to read, I promise, if you read this book, y'all will enjoy right. it. <laughs> you, I, I will definitely give it a read. And definitely, definitely give it a read if you World mail. World Risk Society. Remember that. <laughs> yeah, especially if you mail it to me, I'll definitely read it. If you I bought mail this it. one off of Amazon. I'm, I'm, I'm a hypocrite, right? I buy this off of Amazon, but it was like fifteen dollars. <laughs> no, no thrift store anywhere. All right. So no, you just we, got, we, we got to make Be Bezos rich. We got to yeah, help yeah, Bezos. Yeah. Bezos always needs to get rich. I mean, he is the, the Google money. of selling you things. So, uh, um. All right. We're talking about who takes the responsibility. Turkish tea I'm sipping. That's 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 all. Yeah. The, yeah, Dennis. Who does take responsibility? You know. I think there's a very purposeful desire to ensure that no one takes responsibility because we have a risk-averse society. We right. try to receive increasing ownership over the benefits produced by Others? success, while trying to ensure that no one is responsible for failure. As in, it's fundamentally in tuned with most of our modern society that people don't really admit when they're wrong. People don't really take charge of situations where the blowback can hurt them. Uh, one of the things that I, I always found hilarious was that a lot of political satire will try to say, oh, you're taking control over this important issue? How courageous of you. And courageous became something of a word to avoid. So people would say like, oh, is, is this a courageous decision? Then I must not, cannot get involved. Uh, it's um, it's rather funny that way because if people have responsibility over things that go wrong, then people know who to blame. Mm -hmm. But no one really wants to be in a position to be blamed. Everyone wants to make sure that their grant money continues, that they get reelected, that people continue to buy their products. And if there's something that happens that fundamentally changes perceptions of them, and damages an illusion of infallibility, then suddenly people are left adrift. Mm -hmm. And when you're left adrift, there's no one really to turn to. So you asked who's in charge of dealing with the pandemic? No one is inside of a state like the United States. It should be and, the state, though, right? <laughs> At least. Well, whether or not it's the state depends on whether or not you have other elements of society that can actually step up and take charge. The in military? A, no, no. Why no, not? I'm, the military has, uh, you know, a medical, uh, they can, they could utilize the military service. I mean, well, the, that's what the USS Comfort was about, right? Like, no, I mean, in New York. from supplying medical supplies, things like, in the early well, beginnings. Well, yeah, of that, so yeah. I imagine that yeah. if the world fell apart, the U.S. military would be one of the key providers of aid along with the National Guard. It yeah. would probably be the National Guard over 
like, say, anyone on an aircraft carrier. But with regards towards ordinary society, government government ownership over something is some is viewed with a very large amount of skepticism inside of liberal democratic societies. Liberal. Whereas if you're inside of a country whereby the government is expected to be a paternal caretaker of you, then they ultimately had key responsibility during the pandemic and you saw them take action. So this is China. Like China, is, South Korea. Yeah. yeah. So whenever the government yeah. is a paternal caretaker of society, they took charge because they had ownership. And responsibility for failures is something that made it so that they were, if anything, overzealous in their desire to ensure that the pandemic was stopped right away to the point where there are quite a few nightmare stories out of China. Um, quite a few. In Wuhan, yeah. But, yeah. but Being, only the first month, right? No, mostly. Uh, there are a couple that happened afterwards, um, usually with regards to its censorship rather than, um, rather than being bolted and sealed inside of your house to starve to death. So yeah, anyways, um, not going to touch on that one, but mm -hmm. the idea of the government as caretaker and ultimate responsible stakeholder in society is something that depends on a paternalistic devotion towards, not even necessarily paternalist, it could be maternalist too. It's just this idea that there's someone that's meant to provide for you. As in that when you think about where the buck stops, the buck stops at the top of government, and government is the ultimate stakeholder and steerer of the nation, its economy, and everything else. In the United States, though, we don't have that. So the government actually isn't designed to be the ultimate owner of anything. Um, politicians don't want to be the owner of anything that could harm them, and only owners of things that can help benefit their career. And it's not particularly good because even even certain elements of the academy are driven around consensus because if there's a predominant view this is the whole notion of Kuhn's paradigm shift by the way if things normal fit science. inside of yeah if things fit within the normal uh, fit within the framework of expectation then there's no risk in supporting it and deviations from the homogenized hegemonic framework for approaching things are typically punished until eventually the system is forced to change. Which is why you find a lot of the um, great big shakers and movers of academia to be academian, uh, academicians or professors that publish books that people then end up starting reading. I think um, Richard Dawkins was one of those people when he wrote The um, Selfish Gene, which precipitated in a large movement and introduced memes into the broader public. But yeah, when I'm thinking of when I'm thinking of people trying to be stakeholders, people trying to be responsible in society, I don't actually think that our system, our society is designed for that. Um, whether or not you want it to, I've got no idea. Yeah, I mean, clearly, I mean, when we have something like a pandemic, uh, I mean, if you have sort of like normal, peaceful times, uh, and, uh, you know, then you can say, oh, I don't need government, you know, to, to help me and protect me. But I think in an emergency situation, I think there is, a, you know, legitimacy to be gained by a strong state. Uh, and then there is, I think, a lot of discontent that comes from a weak state. I mean, even if you look at uh, yeah, the New Deal, right, where like the first the first years, like Calvin Coolidge, right, of the uh, Great Depression, uh, and Henry Morgenthau was the Treasury Secretary, and they said, you know, we should have liquidation, right? Which means that, you know, let, let, let the business go bankrupt. Nobody's responsible for unemployment, right? Um, you know, the wages should be downwardly adjustable, which, of course, uh, is not happening as... as, as uh, Keynes described, right, uh, wages and prices are downwardly rigid uh, because of expectations. Uh, and so, yeah, so we went in a tailspin for, you know, a few years, and then the Great Depression was sort of halted briefly by, uh, by the New Deal, right, by reorganizing society, I mean, investing uh, in infrastructure, social programs, uh, public job creation, uh, 
uh, and th- that that that's sort of the, the sentiment that should be channeled uh, in the time of need, which is what we have today with uh, with the COVID pandemic, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, so I I would so I I mean I mean so I, I I do get Dennis' point. I mean that you know we we are not a very you could say uh, pro status society, but uh, yeah. You know, but we do need it in emergency situations. Yeah, yeah, I, I get your point, uh, Dennis. Uh, I have a uh, former roommate of mine. He was strong libertarian. We used to have extensive debates about state power and state. And because I partly grew up in West, at the time it was West Germany, uh, and the state was often more active. And uh, this is where also I became acquainted with something like the precautionary principle, which I debated extensively with him. Uh, I'm, I'm curious what y'all did when you talk about the precautionary principle itself. It, you think that that has to be put into law or it's something where it's a kind of mm, co- governance strategy that should be implemented or with regards to like diseases, for instance, you know, I mean, do you have any kind of role that the state or the legal system plays in implementing precautionary policies? Like, for instance, uh, in the field of health, public health or in uh, workplace regulation, you know, like precautionary policies are sometimes put in place. Uh, if you go work at a place, you know, they, they put in restrictions of uh, workers have to be kind of instructed, you know, with chemicals that they're using. Uh, the same thing with factories, you know, they often have to put in regulations to, to inform um, people if they're working with their chemicals. So my question is, okay, I mean, like, maybe it's a hostility in the U.S. Maybe it's a political culture. I don't know what it is. But why is there such a resistance towards the idea of precautionary state policy? I'm curious why. Is it just because of the the history of the U.S. of this, uh, you know, this this minimal state idea that the state should always be small, government is best when it's small, that even the idea of a precautionary policy uh, scares a lot of Americans. What? Are, I'm curious. Larry, <laughs> Dennis left. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. yeah, no, he's good. No, he's uh, good. What do you think, uh, Larry? Larry, the, per, uh, the precautionary principle. I mean, yeah. so the, um, what do you think? So. So, so I, I think in the very first podcast, I mean, yeah. of course, we had this discussion, comparative discussion of you know, German welfare state and then American yeah. welfare state, and uh, and oh, so, 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 my my theorem uh, is taken from uh, Richard Wolff. He's uh, one of these yeah. left wing economists. Uh, he's now at uh, New School in New York, um, and uh, so he basically talks about. How the U.S. Uh, suffered from a labor shortage mm-hmm. uh, for you know basically since its founding until about 1970, right? So it's a pretty long period of time where um, the, the labor shortage essentially came from the fact that you know so when the European immigrants came, uh, they landed on the East Coast, like New York City and stuff, uh, and then. Uh, and then you would have the the factories uh, on the eastern seaboard, mm-hmm. uh, and those needed labor. Uh, but uh, but what happened is that you know once you paid off your you know indentured servitude, you know which are fees that you had to pay to basically the people that smuggled you over to the U.S. Mm. Um, you know you were basically free to go to you know Midwest, uh, the South, the West, and whatever. Uh, and so it was like a pioneer society. And so as a result, there was always a labor shortage in the factories where the wages were always um, two and a half to three times higher than uh, in Europe, mm-hmm. uh, which is why there were so many Europeans that uh, came to, uh, to the U.S. Um, and so basically, you know, so ba- to, to simplify it, I would say the U.S., had socialist outcomes without socialist policies, mm. right? Uh, which is based, uh, and, and by socialism, of course, we assume now simply equality, right? So you have egalitarian outcomes without egalitarian policies. 
uh, and and then and that work and that's that's how the American dream comes about, where you can have you could say small state, you know, especially like the early you could say Republicans, you know, people like uh, Thomas Jefferson was the first one, then Andrew Jackson, yeah. uh, you know, people in that camp they were like you know the small scale farmers uh, are idolized, right? Uh, and then the evil bankers, you know, like the Alexander Hamilton types uh, on the on the East Coast, uh, the New Yorkers and whatever, the Bostonians, uh, you know, they, they, they are the ones that, uh, you know, sort of oppress us. Uh, and, yeah, and then of course you had like the progressive movement that, that, that came out and like after 1890s when uh, when when Standard Oil became too much of a monopoly company, right, uh, like Rockefeller, uh, it had to be broken up. And I think that was sort of the first, uh, like Teddy Roosevelt was the first sign of, you could say, big government, right? Um, <laughs> uh, and then, of course, the, the nephew, Franklin Roosevelt, was even more of a big state. Uh, and then uh, Lyndon Johnson, of course. So like... Society. I don't want to interrupt you. So, like anti-statism, you would say it's kind of built into the political culture. And individualism was always kind of embraced in U.S. culture, which yeah. makes American exceptionalism is like yeah. anti-statism was always kind of embedded in go- people's opinions about government. Yeah, and it's exactly. quite hard. It's not. It's the very different from European context, where the state always played a role. Yeah, so, so that it, may explain why the precautionary right. principle is. Kind right. of usually uh, laughed at. So I'll say two sentences about the yeah. European yeah. context as well. Yeah. So uh, the European context is basically feudalism, right? So, mm-hmm. so you have uh, the you know, let's say the patrimonial regime that we brought up at the beginning of our podcast, right? Uh, where you have the uh, you know, with a powerful king, or you have the the, the lord, and uh, you pay fealty to him. Uh, you know, there were very few women in power, I would say, none. But, um, and then uh, what happened is you had the Industrial Revolution, right, uh, which changed the social order, right? It favored the, the city, it favored the bourgeoisie, the traders, the merchants, uh, uh, the manufacturers. Um, and then, of course, you know, you didn't have the feudal lord who was protecting the, the serf anymore. Uh, so who's going to protect labor? Uh, and uh, and in Germany, Otto von Bismarck's answer state. was yeah, the state exactly. So it's the social insurance, Excellent. yeah, exactly, pension insurance, unemployment, uh, accident insurance, you know, things like that. So for uh, the U.S., it was the capitalists. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah, takes the care cap- of the the society, right? <laughs> right. I mean, no, I'm just I'm simplifying it. No, I'm no I mean, state. I could be wrong. Yeah, but right. that's, that, that, that's how it did work. And uh, and it went well until about 1970. And then yeah, okay. there's something very shitty that happened in 1970, apparently, around right around that time. Uh, and and actually, like Eric Weinstein, that's one of the people that Dennis referred to, uh, talks about that extensively, uh, which is why I like uh, a lot of the stuff that he talks about, um, which is for him the... You could say the original sin uh, of uh, of American decay uh, is uh, is the decline of economic growth, right? It's like you know, around nineteen seventies, uh, and uh, this idea that yeah, you, you can no longer do egalitarian, naturally egalitarian outcomes. That's no longer feasible. I mean, you do you do need a strong state now, and that's why. Like, so there's, there's this book by a sociologist in Arizona, his name is Lane Kenworthy, and he talks about, like, I, I think the, the book he, he wrote was the Social Democratic America. Oh, yeah. Uh, and, uh, but, I, I, I mean, it's, yeah. I mean, like, when I talked to him, I mean, he, he sounded very optimistic about, like, it was right around when Obama took over in 08 or 09. Yeah. Uh, and it's like, well, there's a possibility to expand uh you know social policy social insurance and things like that but i mean for me the 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 fundamental sentiment here is that if there's you know if there's not enough growth 
there's not enough jobs uh, or there's not enough good jobs, right? Because we have plenty of jobs, but they're all low paid. Um, then, you know, we need the state to sort of come in and, and help us, right? That's, that's a simple point. Uh, all right. Good. Yeah, I got it. Very good. So, you want to keep going? Any uh, other questions? Uh, yeah, Dennis. <laughs> yeah, I mean, whether you are Dennis, I mean, do you agree with that assessment about... Uh, yeah. Uh, I, I feel like I'm being brought in as the adversary here. Yeah, you're the anti-precautionary principal guy. <laughs> no, I'm messing with you. <laughs> really? Okay. <laughs> no, so, I'm messing with you. I'm messing with you. Uh, well, well, I suppose that I wouldn't. I would shift the characterization of the idea of American welfare being centered around the success of the capitalist, and I would shift it to be around the success of the individual. So. In American identity, I see a lot of people who believe that the fundamental core tenant of what it means to be a functioning member of the society is to be able to do basic things around your own home and around your own property, have a job to support yourself, and develop a family. As in, we believed in a framework whereby an individual could have an occupation to survive on their own and build up their own security. And their own security would be in part perpetuated by their children. Uh, this is the entire logic behind the Homestead Act, all those people going out west, Oregon very trail. much family units. And um, you also find this in most of our understanding of what the quote-unquote nuclear family American dream was in the 1950s and 60s and 70s. And it's even still around today. It's just not as prominent, not as dominant, not as successful. But just because the individual was supposed to be centered, we always had within ourselves uh, recognition for people who are incapable of success within the system. So the elderly without a family to support them, widowers, orphans, the disabled, there was always that element of support, but that element of support was always done through personal charity. The U.S. prides itself on being one of the largest givers to society that exists on planet Earth. And if you take a look at American donations overseas, most of our history, it was one of the dominant things that we could do. And a lot of money was given to charities inside of the United States. A lot of those charities were typically religious in orientation. And there was this idea that we could rely on charity. Well, the 70s, uh, 70s had quite a few interesting consequences. Um, we had our first great burst of secularism, atheism, not quite in the 70s, that was in the 60s, but it was a fundamental shift inside of the United States. You saw declining economic prospects, the relative share of what a charity would do diminished, the number of people requiring support increased, Divorce rates went up. Numbers of children living with single mothers went up. Um, you also had increased migration, and a lot of the migration started becoming informalized, particularly around the American Southwest. It was a fundamentally different dynamic, and we ran out of territory to throw people in with the Homestead Act. When was the last home given on the Homestead Act? What was it, 1970-something, 1960-something? No, 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 it was actually, it was more recent than that, but the last good, like, solid land with the Homestead Act was, um, I think, around the 1970s. So there was less opportunities for people to gain landed access to their own means of self-support. And then the economy transitioned so that even landed access was no longer a guarantee. Small farmers all around the world are gradually being replaced by larger agronomic corporations. So we can say that 1% of American workers are farmers, but who are those 1%? <laughs> they are not your poor mom and pop farmers doing a backyard garden. <laughs> they are. They have these robots and these uh, monitoring yeah. systems. It's one of the most industrialized sectors, one of the most closely enmeshed with genetic engineering that exists inside of the U.S. economy, outside of the health sector. Yeah. So that's not our idea of the American great heartland and the farmer 
was killed off by structural changes in the economy. We still have a lot of manufacturing potential inside of this country. Something like 20% of our economy, our GDP, is manufacturing. But how many people actually work? Well, it's 7%, in, right? Yeah. Not, well, not a lot. It's, was it, did you say 7%? 7%, yeah. Yeah, it, it's... Uh, workforce. So I guess they're three times more productive looking at overall share of what's being produced. It's not... It's not what it used to be, and most of the people who are inside of those positions, they're stewards for automation most of the time. Like, hey, I helped build a car. I pushed a few buttons. I moved things over. I moderated the machines. Yeah. I made sure that nothing was broken. Now, granted, that's a little bit that's a little bit too much because there is still a lot of heavy, meaningful blue collar work involved, but the traditional idea of a Henry Ford line doesn't exist. Also, this is, you could also bring back in the producer as consumer inside of the United States because Henry Ford wanted to ensure that all of his workers could buy a Model T. So it wasn't just that he was employing people to make them, he was employing people to buy them. Now, that wasn't exactly a sustainable business model. It did fade out, but it was something that he tried to build, and it's something that a lot of people moved forward with. Even modern corporations inside of the United States still believes that employees should own shares in their own company. It's not a union. They, there's not a lot of support for union control, but there is a lot of support for individual workers to have stock buying options within a company so that they could have partial ownership in the success of the firm. All of this is embedded into what it means to be an American in a classical sense, but it's all transitioning. It's all changing. The end of American exceptionalism, well, well, I don't really want to, I don't want to support that one because I'm actually something of a believer in American exceptionalism, um, and I don't actually think that the dream really died in the American dream either, but I will say that we are becoming, we are entering into a different epoch in economic framework, and we can't even use a reliable benchmark of historical transitions inside of the UK or Germany as examples to support, because our economies look nothing like theirs when they transitioned. We're in an information economy, and we're in an information economy that's in a transition that is going to something completely new, and we don't really know how to work it. It might be that we still rely on fundamentally individualist models of production and charity, but we do so through various mechanisms of transfer of wealth within the society. So what's the ultimate libertarian solution to a world without jobs? It's UBI. Mm. As in, that, 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 that's, that's where <laughs> I, 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 I have as well. As, yeah. as in, that is, the ultimate, that is the ultimate idea of maintaining a capitalist economy, a capitalist framework, an individualist model of development and production and self-care in society, okay. is UBI in a world where no one has a job. Now, granted, we're never going to see that world, by the way. There's always going to be some form of employment, but we will see barriers to gaining access to employment increasing. Uh, education might become free in colleges, but I can guarantee you it won't be free to choose. It'll be maybe more German in that if you want to get a STEM degree, if you want to learn AI, if you want to learn Python and R, then congratulations. We're going to support you. If you want to, say, be a history major or learn how to do music theory, then I'm afraid you get nothing. As in, um, or there's going to be a very limited number of people who can get that. As in, I think that probably one of the easiest ways to make education free is to make it essentially into a trade school for higher level information and tech firms. Um, okay, I have so. new liberal friends out there and they are salivating while you're, while you're mentioning these uh, well, they're salivating in large part because I'm not one of them, but in large part because these are the things that are most easily agreed upon. So the idea of us supporting an education, that means that people can enter into a highly productive center of the economy where they previously had major barriers of entry. Are, are you going to tell me that no progressive in the world is going to say, I want to let all the poor kids from Harlem study science and technology if they want to? get more women in coding and book camp and make sure that they can go to school for free if they show okay. down for it. So, so here's my response to the new liberals, right? So I would say, I think yes, would yes. Okay. Let's fund AI studies and STEM and engineering. I understand all of that. We'll, we'll do that. 
we fully support it. And uh, but we're also going to support the liberal artists. You know, we we're going to uh, and uh, and and we're going to do an UBI right where it's like you sort of every individual you figure out on your own. I mean. And then at the end of the day, you know, if your contribution to society is to uh, post YouTube videos, you know, drumming the bongos, right? Uh, that to me, that's, that's an interesting okay. career, Larry. Can yeah. I get paid to do that? I might do that. that. That would that would be well. I mean, well, you definitely get paid the UBI, right? That's the baseline. True, right? true, true. Right. I mean, extra currency. And All is going to be new work with UBI. And then. And then and then extra currency, yeah. I mean, if you if there's enough people, you know, clicking your link on on, on YouTube for sure. Yeah, I mean, there should be ad revenues coming in. <laughs> uh, I I I I, th I, th I think that uh, we're embracing the capitalism here. <laughs> well, I I think that Google should be uh, a lot more. How should I say? Accommodationist uh, to uh, small YouTubers because at the moment, you know, you have to have a massive uh, threshold to reach. Uh, because, for instance. I mean, if if I put this podcast up on YouTube, I can tell you, if we're lucky, it will be about fifty views. Um, right. So uh, that's way below the you know the threshold for the for the advertising. Uh, yeah. So, so I'm you not getting rich. Something this. like ten thousand is when you start seeing like hundred dollar checks. Uh, it's 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 it's. it's, it's it's something I never had to worry about. <laughs> uh, it's okay. You get a stipend. You're at Princeton. You're doing just. Who fine. knows? One day we'll have a celebrity or somebody watching, and they create a fun for us. You know. Yeah. And we keep talking. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 It, I, I never know. Yeah, you never know. But yeah, I would definitely. The reason why I was going in the direction of supporting science and technology is because that's actually something that Germany does. A lot of the education that gets funded is for perceived ability to gain access to productivity inside of the economy so a lot of people say europe has free college and they think it's freedom of choice in college it's it's not quite the same thing if you yeah. want to choose and do whatever you want in college do whatever you want that's, that's my principle yeah yeah that's... if you want to do whatever you want you need to pay for it because there needs to be some way of monitoring gains for investment well, we, we're already we're already paying for it right it's uh, it's it's in the form of student debt which I think is a very irresponsible form of. Uh, well, yeah, that, that's that's. Culture industry. Look, look, that's definitely one hundred percent true. But if we're talking about making it free, so a free educational experience, that means that it's paid for entirely by a government grant. At that point, you would want to make sure that there's a linkage between what you're studying and outcomes in the broader economy, because. The structural nature of the economy is that there are higher and higher barriers of entry. So we, as people, would want to ensure that more people are capable of reaching those barriers. Yeah. Okay. So, the, so look, I mean, my my advisor, mentor, uh, an undergrad, his name is Randy Collins, uh, who Mike, of course, knows very well. Yeah. And uh, he, his thesis is that uh, you know the link between higher education. And the labor market, which includes the sort of the the higher skilled, upper skilled, uh, like engineering and stuff, uh, it's it's actually very tenuous, right? So uh, actually, a lot of the a lot of the stuff that you do need to know uh, can be acquired on the job, right? Um, you know, I wouldn't have to take you know courses uh, really. I mean, and nowadays with Coursera, I mean, you might be able to do a lot of like self teaching i mean like i i'm taking a machine learning course in coursera right away um just out of curiosity so mm -hmm. uh so you definitely don't need to uh you know pay uh, top dollar in order to acquire certain skills in higher education so then but then if 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 what randy uh is saying is true which i think it is uh then universities have to uh define a new uh, legitimating reasons for existence and for me legitimation comes from this idea of yeah you do what you want i mean if if if, if i if you have 10 percent of our undergrads who want to be music majors i mean my one of my roommates is a music major so uh he, he might be very happy about that um where it's like then so be it i mean uh, of course i mean 
not everybody is going to be like a like a Ronnie Van Zandt, you know, like the uh, what's the song "Free Bird" by uh, uh, Skynet Leonard, um, which is one of the amazing riffs uh, in music history, by the way. The last three minutes of the song, um, but you know, okay, not everybody's going to be at that level of brilliance, right? Uh, but that that's okay. I mean, it, it's okay. I mean, we already. We already live in a world that Dennis described, uh, you know, 20 minutes ago, uh, you know, with the example of agriculture, automation, industrial automation, uh, and then also increasingly service sector automation. Uh, we already live in a world that, that, that that's full of abundance, right? Um, uh, you know, even with, with COVID, we're seeing... Uh, oh my God! It's no longer safe to go to a retail store with uh, retail workers. You know, uh, I only go in if there's a retail robot, right? Because the robot doesn't carry the virus. Mm. Uh, if it's not, it still needs to be cleaned. Yeah, yeah. The the, the well, no, the, no. The cleaning it, those are cleaning robots, right? Self cleaning robots. No, that's yeah, they have self cleaning they robots, have those. and then of course the floor cleaning robots, right? Yeah, we don't have that in the. Far off, sleepy suburbs of Boston yet? Uh, not yet, but, uh, okay. but it might be coming. It might be coming. Um, <laughs> In Boston, and, we just need to go to, to the city. Yeah, but to to me that it's like we we already live in a rich society. We want to help people uh, maximize the potential, and so yeah, uh, if we have, you know, if we train millions of yoga teachers, you know yoga courses on steroids right um i'll be like i i'll be all for it you know Cause... yeah i'd be all for it after we get to a certain point i guess i'm talking about first steps and you're talking about desired end states so if we're already living in a world whereby there's no longer an associated consequence towards very large numbers of the population engaging in aspirations that do not have any connection towards economic growth or sustainable economic production, then that's definitely supportive. Larry, I think you froze. Uh, hopefully you're froze? still there. No, you oh. froze. <laughs> you're there. Yep. yep, okay. So uh, if we're already in a world where you can afford to have maybe 70% of the economic workforce not knowing really anything about technology or able to manage the tools and methods of production and society, then sure, why not? Uh, yeah. If we're still in a era where it is required that a certain number of the economy, uh, a certain number of the workforce needs to be engaged in an economic framework that requires a degree of specialization, then uh, there should be uh, political and economic incentives to ensure yeah, okay. that what uh, is necessary is perpetuated. So the first thing that would happen would be a liberalization and a support of higher level STEM positions. And okay, sure, so, yeah, okay, so there are ways let's... to go around it. Okay. Like I know Google is trying right now to. And I'm raising my hand too. I have something to say about this. <laughs> sure, sure, okay, sure. Okay, okay, I'll, okay, I'll okay, shut okay, up okay, now okay. because <laughs> Larry, Larry's got a two finger, and now Mike's joining in. McDonaldization of higher education. I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you throw in a Big Mac too while you're at it? <laughs> uh, McDonaldization. All right. Yeah, 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 yeah. I could Who use the McDonaldization of this conversation. Uh, Larry, you want to respond first? Go ahead. Uh, I, just, I, I, I have, I have yeah. my stint. Yeah. Uh, so I just just one one sentence, right? So yeah. when uh, when Dennis says you know we should we should train the STEM workforce, I mean of course because I'm I debate Steve Wong almost every day, so I mean I have to be. Uh, up on my toes uh, with, with, with 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 the numbers. Why, why so does he join us? STEM, we can have a four way debate. STEM, yeah, that would be ideal. I mean, but, but yeah, yeah. he dropped one. out. Why? Yeah. Because he, he's he's scared. I mean, he's scared of three academics uh, uh, beating him up. Anyway, um, so uh, I looked at the STEM workforce. We're talking six percent, okay? Six percent of our workforce is in STEM, and then I looked at the Occupational Outlook Handbook, which is. You know, the best guess that the government economists have about future employment. And uh, by the end of the 2020s, uh, the, the STEM employment share is supposed to increase to 6.2%. Okay, so I'm just like, 
you know, even under the most optimistic circumstances, we are increasing the STEM employment share by 0.2 percentage points. Okay. Uh, and so I'm, I don't, I mean, so this whole idea of like we're creating an apartheid workforce, right? Where basically, you know, like the five, six percent were like highly skilled and whatever, the, the technicians of our economy, right? And then the rest of us are sort of toiling away at. at, at you need at, a different word for that one. Um, that, that, that to me, that's the world that we already live in, right? And so I'm not saying, you know, we, we should dramatically, you know, like reduce the 6% to, to down to, you know, 0%, you know, and let AI take over everything, right? Uh, but, you know, we, we already live in an apartheid society, and I don't think it makes sense to talk about, you know, raising the 6% to 100%. This is the whole shtick with uh, Andrew Yang's EBI. Anyway, okay, Mike, Mike will be the next. Please. No, uh, uh, Larry, and uh, this is really addressed to Dennis. Uh, um, I take a classic, I got to be honest, I take a classic Marxian approach here. And the question I'm going to raise to you, I wrote it down before, do you think higher education is a commodity or a public good? Maybe I can get a response. Do you think, high, or is both? Do you think higher education, as we can think of it now, is a commodity, in a real commodity sense, that it's 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 a commodity that has a value, price value attached to it, or you think it it is a public good, serves a public uh, public end, or it's both? It's it's, it's a question of value. What you think val? What is the value of higher education, for instance? And then I'll respond. I want to just want to hear your response first. If what your take is on that, it so, seems like you're going towards that. You think it it should be viewed as a commodity first, and a public uh, service second. Is that maybe I misinterpreted? So we need to disentangle what we're referring to with regards towards education. Higher. Education. So so if we're going to say that people need to be educated in a society to act as members of a society, then that's definitely a public good, but you could arguably say that people homeschooling their kids can do that, um, or any sort of village where you're socialized into the local structures. So that's that's its own subset of it. Okay. So good. if we're talking about public education with regards towards what is required by the government to support in order for you to be considered an educated citizen inside a society. That's typically regarded as K through 12. I don't think many people view that as a commodity. I think people view it as a public good, but they question the value of the good that they're being provided. So you see a lot of people go for charter schools and private education to try to see if they can get a higher quality version of the public. Alternative good. education. Yeah. yeah. Um, Counter to the get, public school system. Yeah, yeah, and then you get to higher level education or tertiary education or sometimes post-tertiary if we're one of us. So what exactly does that mean? And what is that with regards towards it being a public good or a commodity. The education itself doesn't require it being a commodity, but what we're doing right now is engaging in degree and credential acquisition. And the degrees and the credentials are without a doubt a commodity. They are not reflective of a public good. When I have a PhD next to my name in a few years, it, it won't matter from a broad public good perspective. I have no right to demand that I have a credential. That's something that I just don't buy into whatsoever. But if we're no. talking about an expansion of what it means to be someone in society, just to wholly drive that home, the logic behind a K through 12, you can make the argument that K through 12 is no longer sufficient to provide the base level model of the public good of education. And that's something that I would find very easily sympathetic. It's just, you also do need to define what exactly you mean by that measure of education. So yes, a liberal arts component is necessary, but what exactly are we talking about here? Is it a public good for people to develop a credentialed, orientated education in a specific field of their choosing that has no relationship to what is considered a directed orientation towards a public good? So like, 
Yeah, the reason why I brought it up, uh, Dennis, is uh, this was, uh, I'm sure Larry knows this, this is the classic dichotomy that uh, Marx creates between use value and exchange value. Uh, if you ever read David Harvey, he also brings this back. And I'm of the opinion that it could be both. But the idea is, is that education has the use value first, that it doesn't have to produce any exchange value. It doesn't have to produce any commercial value. That's precisely the reason why they historically gave university autonomy, that they were separated from the market. And I think the neoliberal uh, tendency is to think that you could turn uh, a university and apply supply-demand uh, theory. In exchange value. Yeah, in exchange value. So I'm, that's why I'm only criticizing uh, there. But think about it this way. I mean, in, in Germany, there's a whole legacy of Geisteswissenschaften. And those were people that all they did all day was think. <laughs> and there was no exchange value. I mean, they could think all day. They're poets. They're historians. And that was treated as legit. It was a legit public value. It never was an uh, exchange value. But I noticed in the U.S., maybe it's also in England, there's a push that says... Everything that's studied as far as knowledge in university has to also fit to some exchange value that you can make some money off of it. Okay, okay. I, I get exactly yeah. what you're doing yeah. here, but I yeah. will introduce, Maybe it's more. I'll, okay. I'll introduce a division here. So I understand okay. exactly what you're saying. Okay. The universities now are not necessarily places where people go to think. Um, so the universities now are seen as a training program for a workforce. Um, so a workforce, the, a, war, a, workforce, a workforce. Yeah. So the traditional model of the 1990s was you go to college, you graduate, you're in the middle. So we class. are we three already are pariahs, right? <laughs> this context. Uh, I suppose. So yeah, the idea well. was you go to college, you're a member of the middle class. Congratulations. You have done your due diligence. You've done extra effort. You're more educated than the average bear. Right. So right. that's what that used to mean um, with regards to people who are engaged inside of the higher level education systems right now is that you see a vast degree of interconnectivity between the academy, business, social structures, social movements, and political orientations. Mm -hmm. As in some degrees more so than others, definitely. Like I'm not going to pick a fight and say that everyone is in, as involved in the economy or politics as everyone else, but fundamentally the nature of the academy has changed. And another way that it's changed is that you don't really have a bunch of people sitting aside thinking about how the best things are in the world. It is how best do you patent what you produce? Oh, me, and Larry, me and Larry think about things all the time. Right? Well, well, yeah. It doesn't produce an intermediate. It doesn't produce an intermediate exchange value, but it uh, it's just a use value for intellectuals to, to exchange yeah. ideas. And right? um, here's yeah. one of the fundamental things about intellectual the autonomy is important. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And I'm thinking right now of CRISPR, Jennifer Doudna, a cracking creation, one of the most powerful, magnificent tools to transform the entire world. It was produced by a group of researchers in a university with private and public funding that created a technology that will change the way genetics is done permanently to the point where we can create Jurassic Park now if you put enough money into it. And it's just fundamentally bizarre. It was instantly patented. It's now being shifted around in the economy so that people, the traditional role of the academy, as in people just going around thinking to produce thoughts, doesn't exist because the people who are thinking around to produce thoughts are often part of a system that incentivizes those thoughts to then have practical value. So right now we approach the academy in a way that's fundamentally different from any form of genetic orientation with regards towards it having a value that is divorced from a broader economy. As in, I don't, I don't see that. I don't, I don't see that a lot. I mean, maybe in some smaller universities that are free from the yeah. entanglements of a lot of grants from outside organizations, a need to publish things in every single journal in the world to develop credentials, or a broader connection to an economy for grants and donations and support. Is that I'm sure there are people that just get a degree, develop tenure, and think. But the broader system, 
I'm that sure. doesn't exist anymore. Maybe it used to exist in the past, but not as far as I know. What? Oh, something is. Yeah, Larry, did you said something. <laughs> yeah, so the intellectual autonomy here is being undermined, uh, and, yeah. uh, and 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 so. Dennis, what, uh, what you are simply describing uh, is the reality of the world we live in, which is the neoliberal world. Uh, and um, yeah, I mean, from, from, from our selfish perspective, being <laughs> literally pariahs inside the, <laughs> the system um, is, uh, is that you know, we have to fight. I mean, that's all I can say, right? I mean, we have to fight for intellectual autonomy. And, uh, and I mean, of course, as individuals, I mean, you don't really have that much weight. I mean, there, there was an interview uh, that was uh, done with one of my department professors, Alejandro Portes. He was uh, just concluded at the presidency of the Eastern Sociological Society. Mm. Um, and... You know, uh, and and he was asked about the preconditions of sociology, um, and of course the, he related uh, human sciences, like humanities and stuff. Um, and his answer was that sociology uh, and humanities can only thrive in liberal, free societies. So if you have authoritarian countries uh, or if you have liberal societies where the authoritarian current is you know sort of crashing in um, then humanities will die basically uh, and and sociology cannot hope to to exist in those circumstances uh, so and 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 and, and when and and when Alex Portes says it, I think it has a lot of uh, weight because so he, just as a background, he's a Cuban emigre, so he grew up in Cuba. Uh, he, he and his family fled um, the Castro regime when they took over. Um, and he became a successful sociologist in the U.S. Mm -hmm. um, but, but the important thing being that, you know, he could have only pursued uh, the kind of career uh, with the intellectual and social capital, right, the acclaim that he gets uh, in the in the academy as a sociologist, um, because he's in the US, which is the, you could say the center of the, you know, academic universe and the global, mm. global academic universe. Um, uh, he wouldn't have been able to accomplish that uh, back home in Cuba. Um, and uh, so he has this extreme high critical awareness and I think I, I mean I would extrapolate uh, to to our generation I mean us Millennials and maybe born after uh, is how do we fight to preserve the intellectual autonomy right I mean is it, there's this I mean of course you, you well, can go back to oh you want to say something, Mike? Uh, um, well, I, I, among the radical left, uh, there was sometimes this view you would operate outside university structures if they were uh, threatening intellectuals. Now, I am of, I'm of the opinion of Karl Popper, of the Open Society. I, I, I think like you and uh, Alejandro, what's his last name again? I'm Portis. Sorry. Portis. I do think that... In order for intellectuals to do their work, they have to have a free and open space. And this commodification uh, process threatens those boundaries. I really do think they threaten the boundaries. We already see it also have ramifications in countries like, like Hungary, you know, where they really, uh, the president, uh, Viktor Orban, he just bans a university, he bans gender studies, you know. So... The autonomy of intellectuals is vital, it's crucial for an open society. And there I'm pretty much in line with Karl Popper. You know, Karl Popper had the similar view that authoritarianism starts to creep in at the moment and it starts to threaten the autonomy of intellectuals and it, it makes the boundaries go away so the state can kind of 
tell people what to think, you know, what what programs they can offer. And I think that's the creeping in of also commodification because then you start to say you need to have funding to do the research. you got to have money to show it's going to produce a value, an exchange value. Uh, you can't just be, you know, uh, sharing ideas. You have to show an exchange value character. And I think I think that's the same thing. I mean, it's just another way. And it, no offense to Dennis. I don't. I'm not trying to uh, critique you there. I think there no, could I, be some. I, I could. I think there could be some things that uh, could have a commodity value. Could have an exchange you guys value. Can critique me. You no, know? no, no, no. no. I, 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 I think Dennis is intellectual. Yeah. Like, like, yeah. Like, it's no, just, but I, th I think the the boundary the boundary is is threatened. So I agree with you there. It it is threatened through you know this this survival of existence if you're an, an academic if you want to you know you want to study research you have to feed yourself first right so there's all these pressures you have to seek funding so there's all these problems and it's uh, it's, it's it's horrible for knowledge production right yeah. you can, can you imagine in the global south i mean this was crazy i went to an asa meeting uh one before covid19 and we were talking about third world poverty and all of the session members were all members of elite American universities where none of them were represented from any of the global South countries. And they were themselves were saying, this is horrible, you know, from the position of that we're talking about people, but they're not even the intellectuals from those countries are unable to come in, you know, and bring in their perspective. Occasionally, there's one or few that are able to get in. But I was one of those sessions and it was like crazy. I was like, this is crazy. You know? I felt really bad. I was like, I don't know. That's yeah, an example. Well, I mean, but if you say ASA, I mean, it's American Sociological Association. Yeah. So it's not yeah. uh, global. I mean, you could also, I don't know how bad it is at the American Economics Association, or American Political Science Association, but uh, you have to have money to go there. And even getting money, you know, it's difficult, challenging. And even community college students are not often represented there or community college faculty, right? So, but Larry, you you have a community college background, right? Yeah, and right? Dennis as well. I mean, he's raising yeah. his hand there. So we're good. We're, uh, but there are some barriers still, right? There's still barriers that, and also for intellectuals from different classes, for instance, I guess. Uh, there's a money money barrier. Can, can we all agree there? Right. It could be a barrier. Could be a possible barrier. Well, it is. It is the major barrier. I mean, that that. Yeah. I mean, so there's a reason why a lot of academics uh, inside social sciences and humanities, of which I'm a proud member of, uh, we are, we don't like neoliberalism, right? You know, we don't like capitalism, and and because because we because we feel it, right? I mean, it's because it's not it's not an abstract. Well, I mean, it is it is somewhat of an abstract concept, but we feel it, right? We feel it concretely in our lives we know how it's shaping our decisions i mean the fact that we have to feed ourselves that we have to optimize <laughs> you know uh what we're doing um and and that's why i mean i don't know it's like how can we contribute to perspectives that uh you know might be better for us uh and that's why i would i'm also proudly attached to the basic income movement which yeah, includes a lot of non-academics. I mean, it includes, uh, you know, people who are social workers. You know, people who, uh, you know, are active in NGOs. You know, and then of course you have the Silicon Valley types like Elon Musk and uh, Mark Zuckerberg, people like that. Uh, and that's the coalition that we're trying to build. And when you say, "Oh my God," you know, how can you be working together with these crazy billionaires and and I'm like, well, if these billionaires are fighting for the same policies, you know, like, you know, welcome, welcome as a bad fellow, you know, that's, mm -hmm. that's okay. Yeah. Yeah. We, we, we're fighting for a cause of decommodification. <laughs> uh, yeah. Oh, what's uh, Biden's and Harris position anyways with Bicey Kinko? I'm not sure. It's unclear. There's uh, no they, position. There's they no. don't have a position on it, right? Okay. Just uh, uh, Yang, right? Yeah, yeah, no position has. always means against, usually, right? So it's okay. All right. Well, we had a fruitful uh, debate. Want to go longer? <laughs> we'll uh, go for four hours. Minutes for for concluding thoughts. I mean, yeah. uh, 
Well, uh, well, I don't think that I want to go on for another hour or anything like that. Why not? We can do it. Let's go on marathon. <laughs> well, well, I have a feeling that I will both need to go to the bathroom and eat at some point. So, mm. oh well. Uh, so, okay. a concluding thought do, on this do, one. Do you want to give us a positive concluding thought? Because uh, yeah. neoliberalism and higher education is, 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 is the most depressing topic, but the one that keeps coming back up again. Well, but... here's something that I will say. Yeah. With regards towards the academy, it has faced many problems before, and right now it is experiencing one of the largest growth periods it has ever had in its history, and it's not likely to stop in a traditional sense. While we've been experiencing a lot of recontextualization of what the academy means, it's very likely that even if in the future the academy is bypassed completely for STEM education, that there will still be some role for it because of the fundamental way that our society itself has transformed how we view higher education. It will unlikely be a utopic vision in the future about how we approach it, but overall, I can safely say that we will see the emergence of new universities around the world, particularly in the global south, as you see a gradual shift in the economic power and political institutional weight of governments that are emerging into the world that have previously suffered and been able unable to. And I will say that you have two great examples of this. Chinese and Indian universities, Chinese universities in particular. Tsinghua University is now ranked number one, higher than MIT, for engineering producing patents and thoughts and generation of ideas. Uh, we don't have a qualitative measure to see whether or not they are as useful, but we do know that that is a masterful transition from 50 years ago, 60 years ago, when no one would have went there. There's going to be a gradual transformation of the world. There's going to be a transformation of education. And there's going to be a need for people who think deeply about issues that are not necessarily related to economic reward. So there's going to be a place for us anywhere. And for myself in particular, I have the option right away of buying out. I have a master's degree. I have a way to go right into the workforce. But thus far, I've been holding back because what I want to do is develop subject matter expertise in what I view to be one of the most important things in the world, which is how do we increase the native resilience of democratic societies? And right now, there are a lot of people working on that issue, but there seems to be a tension on trying to resolve that. So one way that I thought would be an interesting approach would be to work my way through the academy, spend four or five years really learning about it, and then try to bring what I've learned to the table of the world. Or, so, I mean, or at the very least, have a good time. That's, that's or at the very that. least, have a good time, read a lot of books written by some people that are very famous and mm -hmm. very niche areas of the world. And I don't know, maybe... And Maybe and events if, work out. If your dissertation committee approves your topic, <laughs> they always the dissertation know. Um, <laughs> so no, I don't, the I don't, reason I don't, why I went to Northeastern was because yeah. I didn't even, yeah. I wasn't even admitted there, and I told them what I wanted to do, and they said, hey, let, "Okay, we're good. We Why want you. Oh, we wow, don't wow. even want you to. We don't even want you to force it into comparative politics. You do you over here. We want awesome. you. So at that so point, you'll have a uh, political science, right? PhD. Right, uh, right? Yeah. And it'll probably have a lot of network science behind it, too, and a decent amount of sociology, because... Good. Who knows? We might make you a sociologist. No, <laughs> me and Larry. Uh, hey, Larry, uh, want to invite uh, me to Princeton? Yeah. Maybe we could be classmates. You, yeah. just, uh, you just have to pay uh, fealty to Weber and Marx, uh, and if you do that, I think uh, you know we our discipline will embrace you with wide open arms. Unfortunately, I've been at war with Das Kapital from the moment I read the first volume, so I'm not sure that'll work. Uh, well, All right. 
We can always read Ulrich Beck. Risk Society. That's all this, uh, yeah, he's just going to keep on plugging that book until we read it eventually, right? <laughs> Don't I, 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 burned into my mind. In, I'll read it eventually. In, 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 in our last podcast, you know, you know, when when, when I uh, with with Mike, I mean, and yeah. I, I talked about the disco era, and he kept on I kept on plugging Abba. You know, it's like I'm sorry, I wasn't going to bring it Abba, <laughs> but it's like, but yeah, you know, I remember Abba, yeah. Abba. But you made you made sure that the Ava was mentioned. I was like, okay, there'll be yeah. an honorable mention. I mean, I was talking about David Bowie and uh, Nile Rogers and the Bee Gees. Uh, yeah. that's my favorite, but um, no, I, I, I like to listen to Ava too. But uh, but 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 they were not the the top people in my head. So that's... okay, okay, <laughs> you you were gonna write a paper on that, right? No, um, that was just for pure enjoyment. I, I, I what no 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 this is no 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 paper I it's a blog post about uh, a Nal Rogers biography mm -hmm. and my thoughts on him I was using uh, Randy Collins emotional energy oh yeah that's good uh, good theoretical application yeah 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 it's uh, but that, that that was really fun but you know it's like how do we get uh, you know people uh, engaged in in music I mean that would be a great world to be part of right. Uh, yeah. Uh, but I'm sure you know, Dennis. Your your democracy stuff is important too. I'm sure. <laughs> <Not somebody. laughs> so somebody will 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 think of it as also as important, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I had a good time. It was really good. We ought to do this more uh, often. Yeah, we should definitely do this again. So thank you, uh, much for all right for joining. Yeah. Uh, okay. All right. Is that it.